start from a little bit before like I will start with electrostatics and magnetostatics. The reason being that if I write, just write down the Maxwell's equations, I have to explain the origin of each of the equations and if I do that, that means I am already talking about magnetostatics and electrostatics. So, this also means that I will not be you know uh, dealing with electrostatics and magnetostatics in detail and actually not everything regarding electrodynamics. There will be many, many things which I will not be discussing because of few reasons. First, I have only 5 hours that is the main reason. Second, that this camp is designed for students uh, to get prepared for our PhD coursework. And in our PhD coursework, we are training people to become theoretical physicists. So, you know electrodynamics is used in experiments a lot. Like experimentally, if you want to measure how bright this light is properly, you have to use lots of electrodynamical calculations. I am not bothered about that because that is not what we want you to do. We finally want you to you know solve uh, Maxwell's equation in curved background and quantize that much. So, for that many things are not needed, but mostly mathematical formulation will be needed. So, that is why I will not stretch that much on problem solving because uh, you have been doing it from your senior high school standard and also in undergraduate courses lots of them just one or two problems maybe and in electrodynamics uh, the point is in electrodynamics if somebody gives you a true problem the solution itself if I keep on writing down it will take half an hour or one hour usually those are long ones because those are conceptual problems not value calculating. So, because of that this whole course will be concentrated on formal mathematics and concepts which will be used in uh, theoretical study of uh, or other in theoretical physics that is why very few things will be touched upon and those things will be dealt with from a formal point of view. What do I mean by formal point of view? basically a, mostly a mathematician's point of view. So, that we can build up a theory like what she was asking that am I going to teach uh, quantum electrodynamics. So, the goal is yes finally, you should be able to do quantum electrodynamics. So, I am going to teach classical electrodynamics in a sense that you can do quantum electrodynamics or other you can um, find Maxwell's relation. Uh, uh, solve Maxwell's relation in the background of gravity maybe. Okay. Okay, fine. So, first uh, we will start with uh, electrostatics. So, the elect electrostatics is the simplest thing you know about uh, this whole business uh, where we say that okay, let us start. So, you remember we have something called a charge Q which is electric charge which can be either positive or negative depending on the sign and mind it in electrodynamics many things come directly from experiments. So, there is no derivation of it this tested the forces the interactions and they tried to fit equations to those data and somehow they could fit it. So, these are constructed equation not derived equations. So, the question was that if there is a charge then there is another charge say q I am not going to consider the sign anymore. So, if there are two charges so, what are what is the electro electrostatic force between it? And we know that is the Coulomb's law that says the force 
electrostatic force that uh, the charge Q experiences is proportional to Q. Q means capital Q for us is the test charge. So, I am asking the question that what is the force uh, capital Q experiences because of small q. Actually, that is the same force small q experiences because of, because of capital Q, but experimentally you fix a test charge. So, I consider this to be the test charge, just a notation. So, this depends on capital Q and also on small q, but this force is inversely proportional to the distance between them, the magnitude of the distance square. It is inversely proportional to that, that distance is this much. But then, this distance is not only a scalar, it is a vector and force is a vector also. So, it must have a direction. So, they figured out that the direction is along this separation. So, R okay. and if I am talking about the force experienced by capital Q because of small q, the direction is along this direction. So okay. you allow me to apply yeah. the same yeah, please. I don't want to miss the current lecture. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, so, this is just the direction. So, this is the unit vector. So, it does not have any magnitude, but it represents the direction from small q to capital Q. And so, I said the force is proportional to these all these things and all. What is the proportionality constant? So, you can put some constant and experimentally they figured out and they wrote it down something like this. Why the constant looks like this? Do not ask me, it is the unit system of the Coulomb's time 300 years ago. So, it has something, something, something. I am a theoretical physicist, I actually do not bother about this. I just need the symbol. This symbol is important and it will occur again and again. That actually this 4, four pi factor is taken out. In some other unit system, this can be completely one. Okay. So, this epsilon naught is a physical quantity actually. It is called the permittivity. I think 1 t, but check permittivity of I write a bracket and space. We will come back to this later when discussing electrodynamics. This bracket means I want to write free space. This 0 means it is for free space, but if you have a medium that I am not talking about right Just keep it in mind. For now, for us, it is free space unless I specify a medium. Okay. So this is the Coulomb's law. So some properties it satisfied also experimentally. One is linear superposition. That means if I put another another charge Q prime say near capital Q, the force due to this Q and force due to this Q prime on capital Q are independent of each other and that is why we can add them together. So, you add them vectorically, vector addition. Remember these are not scalar quantities. So, that means if I have many, many charges, point charges, I can write down this F as 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. I can take capital Q outside, I can write a sum from 1 to n, say there are n number of charges, then Q i r i square, then you need vector r i. Because for each, each charge Q, Q i, all these factors will be different. The direction will be different, the distance will be different and the charge will be different, it can be anything. Okay. So, uh, 
right now there is an issue. Uh, the issue is that I am just talking about the force that is, let me write it as capital Q, that the force experienced by capital Q only I am talking about. But other charges are feeling force due to capital Q, right. And you can see this force depends on the separation. So that means it depends on the configuration. But if this capital Q charge also affects the other charges, it will change the configuration because it will exert a force also. So these values are not fixed, strictly speaking. So that means this whole formula is useless. So why we are taking it? The point is that we assume that these charges are very small in size. That is first point, that they are very small in size. So that their separation is millions times larger than their size. Okay? So that means that you can always assume large separations. But if you consider only large separations, what will happen? The force value will be very, very less. Okay. So there is a problem. That is why the concept of point charges. So that means we are not talking about two big bodies interacting with each other. So you can have charged bodies which are big, then actually this law breaks down. We are talking about only point charges like this. Okay? And while writing down this equation, we are totally neglecting the force of this state charge on the other charges. And also the force due to this Q on this Q prime. We are neglecting that also. You can consider it to be large separation or you can consider Q and Q prime to be small also. But we are saying the separations are such that uh, the sizes do not matter. And that consideration you have to do. You can say that okay, I can consider those charges to be very, very small. But physically, in reality, experimentally you cannot do that. Because you know fundamental charge as a unit, the electrostatic charge, right? right that is mainly established. Classically, there is no limit. But quantum mechanically, right now experimentally we know there is a minimum charge that the charge of the electron or proton whatsoever. So that you cannot go be, uh, below that. And also there is a problem, quantum mechanically we know that charge particles always have some volume. They are not point. Okay? So that means if it cannot go to a point, what will happen? It will have some volume. So there will be portions which will be charged and they will interact with each other. They will have Coulomb repulsion, attraction, whatever. Same charge means repulsion. That is the law. If that happens, if there is repulsion, then what will happen? There will be some repulsive energy within the same charge. And if you calculate, if it goes smaller and smaller and smaller, that energy will increase because it is proportional to 1 by r square. So if you take the limit going to point particle, this energy, this force is infinite, the corresponding energy will be infinite also. So what happens? The point is that because we have a definite size, you cannot go smaller than that, you do not have infinite energies. And that is one of the biggest triumph of quantum electrodynamics that uh, was mentioned hardly calculated result that actually shows that the universe is stable. That was very important. But for us classically we take the assumption that they are point particle. And 300 years ago experiments were not that uh, you know precise to go into small scales. So all results were correct. Okay, I digressed a little bit, I should not. So this is the thing for a configuration of particles n of them. But now let us talk about a system where there are too many particles, so much so that the system looks continuous. If it is continuous, we have to consider infinite number of particles, which you physically cannot do. The better way is to consider that there is a charge distribution, uniform charge distribution with a charge density. So it is written as 
for continuous uh, distribution, there are infinite number of charges. Yep. Uh, you can take the test charge out always. Okay, let me explain the notations. Now, because I am talking about continuous distribution of charges, I have to have some coordinate representing those positions. Earlier it was I, just an index. Now it's a coordinate. And which, what is that coordinate? That is Y for me. So the summation was replaced by integration. You know how to do it. First point is that that means if I'm giving a coordinate to these individual charges, that means the force will also have a coordinate. That is the position of Q. So that I have to label. Okay. So this is X, where this charge Q lies and all, but the force will be a function of this coordinate. Q is a constant quantity, so we do not matter. Then, if you consider a continuous distribution, what happens? You have to consider a small element. Say this is the distribution of charges. You have to consider a small element somewhere here. And that will have a finite size and that means that will have a finite dimension. And the dimension of, the, what is the dimension of space is volume. Okay. So that volume for us is d dy. Why I am writing d? Usually I write, I should write 3 because this is true for any dimension actually. So I am writing d. You can write d cube also. But it will have a dimension of volume. So that means when you write down this, then you will ask that what is the charge of that volume? Okay, you just multiply with some charge, what will happen? That quantity will be not Q, but Q into volume. So you have to define something that charge per unit volume. So that you can define the total charge of this volume. So this rho dimension, say charge per unit volume. So this is charge density. Okay. So charge density into volume element gives you the charge of small volume. Okay. And each such small charge rho d dy exerts a force on this capital Q and that is the force which is this apart from this sign that is the force. Yeah. By yeah. d dy so yeah. you mean y lowercase or uppercase? Oh, this y? Yeah. It's this small. Superscript or something like no, no. This d, d superscript it is like dqy kind of. Yeah, why is small? Why is downstairs? It's, oh, it's just I'm limit. Sorry. It's an integration okay. measure, I nothing else. Do, uh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so this part, for uh, forget about this integral sign. This part, multiplied with this, gives you the force on capital Q because of this small element, where the density rho lies, rho y lies. Okay. So, what is the force again? Superposition principle. No. So everything is consistent and this is the most general result. Okay. So we can notice one thing immediately that this capital Q appears everywhere just it stays outside. It is a constant quantity it actually does not matter. So if you want to generalize this theory you have to remove this capital Q that this, this is applicable to any test charge to talk about force per unit charge and that is exactly the electric field of x. This is just 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. Just remove the capital Q. So rho y d dy, sorry, there is a r. So this small r now, okay, r I should mention again R vector is the difference between 
x and y. So in my all my notations, if I represent a vector function, local function or any function, scalar function also as an integral over some coordinate, my dummy coordinate will be y, my notation is there. So the integration is always over y unless mentioned otherwise and x is the free coordinate. Okay, that will be my notation. Some people use x, x prime or even you can reverse it also sometimes. I will do it one step, I will uh, tell you about. So the physical picture is something like this that there is a q somewhere at some point and this is uh, r vector and there is some o origin somewhere, my coordinate origin. So I call it O. So I give a position vector to Q which is X and I give a position vector to this small element, charge element as Y. So R is X minus Y, that means it is this vector in this direction, clear? So this is very important, the geometry you should be very clear about. The geometry is that above some origin which you can change, that depends on you. Coordinate system is not physical, that you fix. That about some origin, you can take this origin inside also, doesn't matter. So about this origin, okay, one more thing, this capital Q can be inside also. Mathematically, there is no difference. Physically, there will be, because the repulsion will be too high, <laughs> or attraction will be too high. So usually, we consider something like this. So this is a volume because I am doing a volume integral. So you can write V here also or here, you can write. So this is the volume and uh, so with respect to that origin, the state charge is always position X and that's why that will be the coordinate for force or force per unit charge which is actually electric field, that is electric field. And the coordinate of the charge element is y. And you can see everything is consistent now. And you are integrating over y only, not x. That's why x is staying there. So this diagram always remember. I could draw this diagram from this equation, but this equation also applies to this diagram, but there is no capital Q now. If you talk about electric field. There is no capital Q, just there is a reference point somewhere, okay. But that point is fixed for us, okay. So so you can so now solve any problems. <laughs> so I have actually list uh, some exercises, not for you, not to judge you or not for you to, you know, submit it with a full thing. You know, just to do them again and again later on. I just mentioned there are no problems, nothing. But before going into that, because you can now calculate electric field. I won't ask you to calculate the force because they are essentially the same thing, only a constant factor. So, but there is a little generalization I should mention. I immediately wrote a volume integral here or let's consider this formula which is more general uh, because there is no capital Q. I said it's a volume integral. So I already physically assume that there is a volume of charge that is interacting with the state charge, okay. But what if there is no volume of charge but there is a say sheet of charge, a surface. In that case, so if there is a sheet of charge Again, you now consider a surface element and do the same game. Everything will be the same, but instead of volume, there will be a surface say S. In that case, the formula is simply electric field X, 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught, sigma Y, R square R, DS. This is not entirely correct, I am just stopping, just to explain one thing. 
that now you talk about surface charge density, this is the charge per unit area into surface element, everything else remains the same, this uh, R square is just this modular square, right? same. But and that is the crux, I think you have, you are learning uh, this vector algebra, right, in linear analysis. Uh, honestly speaking, you should be very comfortable with divergence, curl and Laplacian kind of things when we talk about electric. Brush up, brush up, brush them up you will be needing because I do not have time to you know uh, derive them directly, yeah. But so here there is a problem, uh, can anyone tell me what is the problem? If I write down, write it down like this, there is a problem, it is not correct, what is the problem? No, that is always there, that is classical electrodynamics, there will always be singularity. Otherwise, uh, Feynman would not have gotten a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, what is the problem, physically? Okay, it is very simple, very classical, see that is why I talked about geometry and you should know your coordinate geometry better. Although I am talking about a surface. No, boundary will come. Although I am talking about surface, it is a two dimensional object, my space is still three dimensional. So, this surface or the surface element ds is not a scalar quantity, surface is always a vector, at least the surface element is always a vector, surface is actually a tensor honestly speaking, but surface element is always a vector. So, this has a direction, what is the direction normal to the surface element, okay. So, I have to put a direction. So, you see one direction is this, one direction is this, what is happening? Left side I have a vector, here I have two vectors multiplied scalarly that means it is a tensor, it is not correct, I need a dot product there should be a dot product. So, here just a multiplication, but there there will be a dot product and this is true for any dimension. If you consider a surface that is one dimension lower, that means the surface element will have a direction, it is a vector. So, you have to write it down like this, okay, fine. And finally, uh, if not a surface, if it is just a line, then what? If it is a line, I have to consider a line element like this, which I label as DL. Again, the same concept, there will be some direction, okay. And you write down your electric field as lambda y r square okay so there will be a dot product but there is a catch i didn't tell you that you can actually uh, sorry 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 my mistake that dot product I should write R this side, I should write this side. No, this is, this dot product is not actually with R, you could have taken, but this dot product is actually with this sigma. See, this is charge density, this is charge density, why sigma, I am telling you that, that is a, a little bit confusing issue in, uh, when I talk about current it would have come. The problem is sigma is a scalar quantity, actually it is a scalar quantity, but surface element is a vector quantity. So, what happens that you take a dot product, I could have taken a dot product with R, but that would have made this scalar, but electric field is not a scalar, then what is happening? 
<laughs> okay, I got confused for a moment also. So what happens that this is a dot product because this sigma this is a charge distribution how to say about it that physically that sigma is generated by a current honestly speaking that current will keep on moving the charges across the surface and when okay i'll talk about potentials again and again okay um, uh, later so actually i am talking about a future thing kind of so what will happen that this charge will move around and it will become fixed when the potential difference is minimized oh sorry vanishes when the potential difference vanishes there is no movement about the charge so what is happening that this charge multiplying with sigma you can consider it as to be a dot product itself with the charge actually with the current honestly speaking that will uh, i'll show when we'll talk about uh, currents um, basically uh, magnetostatics but finally we end up with sigma dot ds which is a scalar quantity it might be confusing it is confusing the sigma dot ds is not a uh, it's not a vector product vector scalar product it's not a vector scalar product just a multiplication but essentially remember ds is a vector in three dimension so what finally we say that this ds is not but this it's an element but later on whatever surface integral i am going to use ds will be a vector right now what is happening that inside the surface dynamics i am not talk it is electrostatic it's not currents i am not talking about anything moving in here so it is finally reached the equilibrium already so that's why i am not writing the dot anymore but mind you always you cannot take the dot r if you do that the direction of r and that is actually the direction of electric field so you cannot take the dot product with r same thing goes here it is something like this and if you just multiply it with a um, you just take a time derivative it becomes actually current or other current density when i talk about current density you will see we'll do a lot of shifting then it will be clear but for us all practical purpose simply means you can move the arrow and you can consider lambda integral or sigma into ds to be a scalar quantity that's it but they have directions remember that so later integrals i'll be using it okay sorry so fine uh, till now it is okay but here i'll come to something which is very very important and i will come to that again when i will be talking about poisson equation and laplace equation this integral or something like this when you take the continuum limit there is a problem always say so consider the situation of point charge if there is a point charge in this whole big volume distribution only at one point there is a charge okay and that point means according to calculus i can take a volume element or line element or circle uh, element some element so i am calling it dv some element i can take it can be line element surface element or volume element whatever and there is a charge lying somewhere but i am talking about the situation of i say this has to be the generalization for point charges it's a most general case so what if there is a point charge so say there is some charge in this volume i said uh, per unit volume density is rho but this, this might be smaller than a unit volume so i said some charge is there right and from uh, according to this formula that charge is rho into dv so the charge here which i consider dq it's rho into dv right then you integrate you get the total charge distribution and everything but the point is if that is the only charge you see dv is very small and rho is what 
it is big, small, what? See, mind you, there is no charge anywhere else. There is no charge. Only here there is charge. So what is rho? I'm talking about point charge, right? Point charge. I'm just asking what kind of function this density is. Because if density is finite, say, dv is infinitesimal, and there is no charge anywhere else, if I do the integration, the integration will be 0. Right? Because what is the uh, basic principle of calculus? That when you integrate, integration measure or dv is very small, tending to 0. And now the situation is I am saying there is no charge anywhere else but at only at this. So that means if it is a finite charge, rho into dv, that will be 0. Then you do an integration, it will be 0. But we know for a point charge, this is the case, which is not 0. Experimentally you measure then what is the problem? You will say the formulation is wrong, continuous limit is wrong. Okay, I cannot say it is not wrong. What I can say that this is this works perfectly. But why I cannot say it is wrong? Because the solution of this problem is what? That people are still, you know, mathematicians are very mad at uh, physicists because of that. Because the only way this continuous formulation will uh, make sense that this dq is finite and this dq can be finite given that dv is very small infinite symbol that this rho is infinite but if you make this rho infinite everywhere then this integral will be infinite again because there are lots of infinite number of dqs so the condition is that this rho has to be infinity say this is some particular position y naught say particular position of this element when y is equal to y naught and 0 when y is not equal to y naught that is the condition we need and remember y's are continuous variable and there is one thing that satisfies this that is called Dirac delta okay so this rho we take to be this or rather yeah we take it to be like this when x is equal to y basically it means that if you come to this point y not particular that position y you come to that position it will be infinite so an infinite multiple which is infinite similar quantity at that point so this will be something finite then you integrate over everywhere else it is zero so only this point will be picked up and that will be finite quantity okay so this integration will look like if you integrate this part i'll just say rho d d y r square just this much i'm forgetting about the vector unit vector it also i you can write it down you can keep it that is mathematically correct actually if you do this integration following this then q, q is a constant, if I do this integration, the formula is that everything here, uh, oh sorry, this is not y, I, this is y naught, I chose the position, right, y naught, this is y naught. So why not? Everything here will just go away, only the value at y not will stay. That will come. And if you just calculate, you will find out this to be q divided by x minus y whole square at x 
minus y uh, okay I should write it r naught e vector that much what is the r naught unit vector you replace y by y naught there it will just pick up that position wait did I do a mistake oh sorry 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 one notational mistake this is not x this has to be y because rho is a function of y right rho is a function of y rho does not depend on x it is a property of the charge distribution otherwise it would have been 0 sorry <laughs> this is y. So, y naught is practically a parameter. So, finally here actually what happens that y naught gets picked up and this will be your result and multiplying the constant in front you will see this expression finally will give you this one. Okay, so what I did here, I said this Dirac delta, okay, I should write D, yeah, this Dirac delta is something which just picks out when you integrate over, it just picks out the value at that point, at when y is equal to y naught, rest is 0. So, mathematically, uh, yeah, just let me put down the property somewhere here that if I integrate over pure Dirac delta say x minus x naught if I do something over dx, d dx whatever, this is equal to 1, my normalization is this, this is 1 if the integration volume contains x naught and 0 if x naught does not contain uh, sorry x naught is not contained within the integration volume then it is 0. So, basically it is like a infinity sitting at a particular point. So, there is an infinity kind of infinity value particular that point it is sitting. If it is inside it will give you a finite value. If it is not out, uh, not inside it will give you 0. So, that is the property. Then if it is multiplied with some function like here. Okay. In that case, uh, let me write it that side. Then say y Dirac delta x minus y dx to just f of y naught. That is it. So, it again picks out the value at that particular point y is equal to y naught, sorry, not x. I should write, yeah, same notation, yeah, it is not a y naught. Ah, in this uh, integrals, you can use any uh, any variable because I am not talking about electric field anymore, just it is a generic case. So, this is the concept of Dirac delta. So, if I just write it, then again I am just giving a symbol, you will ask me what is the functional form and all. Honestly speaking, there is no functional form. It can be expressed as a limit only. And funny thing is that this is actually not a function at all, mathematically strictly speaking it is a distribution. Distributions you cannot write them down as a proper function, but you can write them down as a limit of some function. So, yeah, <laughs> a little bit, I will come to game function a little bit, yeah, yeah. So, I will hand you over some problems, uh, no, no, not right now. So, I will move on to something else right now. So, we are carrying the definition of electric field. Yeah. Yeah. No, I will be giving that. Okay. So, this is the formula for electric field, that is it, we are taking it over and this is the physics I talked about. So, uh, this things off. Ah. So, this is called Gauss's law. So, I think uh, people already know about it, uh, some people at least the formula. So, this is a very useful tool. 
okay i'll tell you i gave you electric field you can now calculate the electric field if i give you a charge distribution any charge distribution right you directly calculate force for each of them or if you can evaluate the integral for continuous distribution you can do what gauss's law does it makes your life simple it makes it easier actually how you will see that's why i want to give you some problems see if i give you coulomb's law i am calling it coulomb's law your mathematics will be long but you don't need to think about physics you can just blindly calculate yeah yeah, yeah. it's just the sorry yeah why you treat it is so difficult why it's just you know you just like high school because i want no want them to do phd no. in theoretical physics <laughs> that's a problem not in their imagination yeah. <laughs> so the perspective should be changed actually <laughs> that is needed yeah, yeah, true, yeah. yeah so if i give you gauss's law it is something that your calculation will be easier but then you should know how to apply it in the particular problem how we'll see so let's consider a situation when you have a charge like this and it is surrounded by a surface okay so you have electric fields coming out of the charge obviously that what we saw so you see these lines of force will be going like this what do you mean by lines of force that at each point in space around this say charge let me call it q small q at each point you will feel a force and force will have a direction so at each point you can add a small arrow and what will be the direction the radial distance basically the distance between that point so oh not like this we should start from here yeah from the point yeah something like this so at each point there will be a vector and these vectors will be radial going symmetrically out from the point and so it's a it's a easy way to f uh, picture the electric field like some arrows going out radially so that is your electric field uh, electric lines of forces okay put a charge inside a surface s and mind you this is a closed surface so it's like a balloon you are sitting inside the balloon you are the charge so some of these lines of forces will go out across some surface element and the surface element remember i told you surface is a vector now that notation will come down okay let me draw it like this it's a three dimensional view so just uh, be a bit uh, imaginative with me draw better than me <laughs> then it will be easier okay so this surface element will have some direction so surface element means it's so small that i can consider it to be flat and that means you can define a normal unique normal to the surface and that will be vertical to the surface so i am calling it n unit vector n that is the direction of the surface then the lines of force or the electric field direction because of q will be at some angle to it so it will be my electric field direction i'll call it theta okay the angle between them is theta okay so now i want to calculate the element e dot ds so this small element is ds so i want to calculate this e dot ds and then integrate over s and i'll put a circle on it that means this s is closed so it's a closed integral now what is this quantity so this quantity is just it says the it says the electric field multiplied with area the whole area it just says that 
So this quantity is actually known as, I should not use that limit, I'll use F. Oh. It is called flux. <laughs> it's not force, it's not that force, it's flux. It is called flux. So one physical way of thinking it is that, so there are too many arrows, right? All the arrows are going like this. So you're asking that, what is the total number of arrows passing through the, this area? That, that is actually given by this. But the problem is these arrows are not parallel to the direction of the area. That means they are not parallel to N or rather they are not all parallel to, uh, sorry, perpendicular to S. But there is a special case when this theta is zero for a special kind of surface. What kind of surface it is? Okay, what I am saying that this theta angle can be zero, that they are parallel and an E can be parallel for a particular kind of surface. Yes, exactly. But not a complete statement. I should have the charge at the center of the sphere. Even if it is spherical surface, if you move the charge a little bit, then there will be a non-trivial theta. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So this theta that I am saying that usually electric field and this normal N are not parallel. So there is an angle. That theta can be zero only if this surface is, is a spherical surface and the charge is at center. Because the spherical surface from the center, the normal vector is radial and the electric field is radial, so they will be parallel. For all other cases, if you shift the charge from the center inside a spherical surface, there will be a non-trivial theta. But let there be a theta, doesn't matter. So I'll use the vector law that this will be E ds cos theta. So I use the dot product. So this means magnitude and all. So let me uh, put the value, this is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. Then, uh, yeah. So S, S uh, this will be. Um, So there will be this is uh, yeah. so it's a point charge, right? So that's the point charge formula, not this formula. This is for continuous distribution. This is just a point charge formula. So this is this much. But uh, what is ds cos theta? So if you notice from here. Ds is here, Ds cos theta is a projection of Ds along E, right. So roughly Ds cos theta is something like this. Obviously cos theta is less than 1 if theta is not 0. That this Ds cos theta area, this, yeah. This cos theta area is smaller than this. How do you know the co this area is like this? You just follow the normal. So this is the normal to ds. ds cos theta will be along E, right? So this will just rotate like this. But because this rotation is about an angle you are talking the cos theta, it is not a rotation, it's actually a projection. Projection of this area ds along E, right? So area got smaller. But this new area is nothing but the area perpendicular to this E, okay? Now consider a sphere, perfect sphere around Q of the same radius r, smaller. So this element will now belong to that sphere, although the original surface area may not be a sphere. So the surface area, this pink surface area will be a perfect sphere. 
because all these elements for every ds i can consider ds cos theta and that ds cos theta will be perpendicular to this e right or it is along e if you consider a normal so if you add all of them it will construct a perfect sphere around q and if that is so then what is this ds cos theta this is nothing but what is the formula for that r square that's why i told you that you should know your vector calculus very well <laughs> now so this is the surface element of a sphere right yes. of the same radius as this and there is no dr dependence obviously because this is radially it's a sphere this pink sphere so because of that the radius square is there but there is no measure no dependence on r of the measure so this is just the small solid angle like this now if i substitute this in here this r square will be cancelled i can take q out so what i will have that simply this and if you integral over solid angle in three dimension okay i am taking the short root you can integrate over theta then you can integrate over phi those are simple angles one dimensional angle d phi integral will give you 2 pi it's just a circle and d, sin theta d theta integral will give you 2 okay so 2 into 2 pi is 4 pi so d omega integral is actually 4 pi so i'll have q by epsilon now and this is gauss's law that e dot ds Equal to q by epsilon naught. Now, can you appreciate the power? The power is that this is true no matter what is the surface, this white surface. No matter what is the shape of the surface, this is true. It does not matter. So, it can be applied everywhere, anywhere to any problem. So, how to practically use it? I will just talk about it. I will give you some problems you can apply it to there. The use is that if you have some charge distribution, say this is some charge distribution in space, some arbitrary thing. So if you are smart, you will consider a surface area and closing this volume a little bit away so that Did I miss the? It is 4 pi. Just 4 pi. Because r square will be there, but that r square will be cancelling oh, with this. Okay. R square so square. basically, this will cancel with this. The remaining this integral is d omega. Oh, okay. That is 4 pi. So, uh, what I am saying that if charge distribution is somebody gives you a charge distribution. And usually in the problems, okay, physically true also in some cases, we consider a charge distribution which is on a dielectric or a conductor or whatever. What will happen? The charges are already equilibrated. I will talk about potential a little bit later. So, charges will be equilibrated. So, these lines of forces will always be perpendicular to the surface. Yes. Now, if you can consider your so called Gaussian surface, this surface for your problem, such that at each point it is perpendicular to the charge distribution your e dot ds is very simple you can take this e out because e and ds will be par uh, parallel to each other you can take e out of that uh, integration you can do the ds integral that's a scalar integral if you can do total surface area whatever with the total surface area and whatever be the total charge and you are done it becomes so simple so if you have a long uh, long line like this your surface area will be a cylinder 
if you have a point, your surface area will be a sphere. If it's a ball, it will be a sphere again. So you have to consider, yeah, so that the normal to the surface is always parallel to the electric field at each and every point. If you can construct that surface area, your vector problem will be a scalar problem. And relatively, it is much easier to solve. Only non-trivial thing left is to do the surface integral. And for example, for a sphere, if I take a sphere point, point particle, say, surface area is a sphere. If I take, I do that, you can automatically, I don't need to calculate even. You do the surface integral, what is the total surface area? 4 pi r square. So e into 4 pi r square, right hand side q divided by epsilon naught, divided. You will exactly get the electric field formula for point particle. Done. And how about the sheet? Yeah. The yeah. Same. You can do the same things. For sheet, it is r square. So see, inverse square nature is built in this formula. The surface area in two, the three dimension is 1 by r square. Oh, sorry, r square. So it will always divide. So dimensionally, it is correct. And the constant will also come if you calculate. Okay? Fine. So this is Gauss's law. But this is not the form we'll finally play with. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take just two minutes. So this is this much. Now, you just consider this Q to be again a volume distribution. So I can write this as E dot ds s is equal to 1 by epsilon naught rho some y d dy. Just this much. Is the total charge right? Integration of density. OK. I can do that. Uh, so this is the so-called volume. This is the surface. Now, I can play a game that is called uh, Gauss's divergence theorem. That says the surface integral, if surface encloses a volume, I can write down it as divergence of E over the same volume. So the situation is that this volume V is enclosed by a surface. So whatever here or whatever here, that is the thing. Inside is volume V. And how you come from here to here, that is your, uh, I think you did linear algebra. So you did not do vector calculus, but that is in vector calculus. So I take it as a formula. Okay, you find it out. Take Arfkin and Weber, two pages, done. If anybody has any confusion. So yeah, I just changed the uh, surface integral to a volume integral. Now the argument is that this volume is arbitrary. This volume can be anything. Why arbitrary? Because given a charge distribution, say any charge distribution like this, I can consider this surface or I can consider this surface. So volume will change, surface will change also. So but the mathematics will, uh, sorry, the result will be the same, Gauss's law will prevail. That means this choice of the surface and the volume is totally arbitrary. You choose it in the way that it is the easiest to do. Otherwise, you can choose anything. So because the volume is arbitrary, this relation can hold. This is also volume, same volume. This integral can hold only if the integrands are equal. Right? So you write. This is the differential form of Gauss's law of electrostatics. And I leave you with it. This is the first Maxwell's equation. Okay? Okay, the simplest one, simplest form. This is not the most general form, but practically we will be using it. So this is the first Maxwell's equation. Okay? And uh, immediately, uh, should I? I leave it. Okay, fine. So, yeah. So, let's have a break.
ओके बैक टू इलेक्ट्रोस्टेटिक्स सो टिल नाउ वी टॉक अबाउट कुलम्स लॉ आई विल कॉल दिस इक्वेशन एज कुलम्स लॉ that the solution for electric field which is rho of y square then so this unit vector r means the vector r is x minus y so this is r square okay and then we found the gauss's law two forms um, which expression i did i write down yeah you were still not one second and there is a differential form that okay fine so i told you that they essentially calculate the same thing they calculate the electric field uh and the electric field if you want to calculate the electric field in this method i said it is kind of difficult like you have to depending on the system it might be long this is short but you have to be intelligent so uh, i actually wanted to give you some problems uh, just i'll list down a few exercises now you we don't need to do it now um, uh, all of you have done them earlier just for comparison say consider this problem i'll just draw so i am considering a one dimensional system a straight line only so at x is equal to 0 there is this state charge say you can consider or you can consider this to be the point point p x is equal to 0 is the point p where i want to find out the electric field okay and consider there are multiple positions different positions say this is x is equal to 2 this is x is equal to 4 this is x is equal to minus 1 this is x is equal to minus 3 say and put some charges q say minus 2q anything arbitrary say q here and minus q here so find out the electric field at point p so that is the problem the net electric field because of all these charges and the calculation is simple that you consider one charge at a time and find the electric field then add them up you get the net electric field at p so you do that so which approach is more useful just think about it the second problem is this consider a square of side length 1 one one unit any unit centimeter meter anything kilometers at the center you consider the point p and at the corners find say different charges now what is the electric field at point p that means both magnitude and direction so what you will do you will calculate individual electric fields and add up whatever you can you want to do or do you want to apply the gauss's theorem or something okay for this i'll tell you this method is easier this method is far more easier to calculate then if i consider some other problem say problem 3 consider a long wire straight wire straight line straight conductor whatever you say and it has some charge but because it's long and continuously distributed i have to define some density charge density as i told you 
let's consider the total length is you can put from 0 to l you can consider uh, total uh, charge uh, the so called linear charge density is lambda so that is the charge per unit length of this wire or conductor and you consider a point p here just above the midpoint at a height say small h now what will be the electric field at this point that is the question okay for all of them just find electric field at p okay then question number 4 consider a circle of same charge density lambda radius capital r and consider a point above the center at the height h p find the electric field at point p that is the problem okay this kind of similar it's a straight line it's a circle okay now question number 5 consider a spherical surface so this is nothing this is just the glaze it is not a circle it's a spherical surface it's a spherical balloon it will there will be some center and the radius is say capital r and i'm taking a point p somewhere here at a distance smaller so fine uh, so it's a surface so there will be a surface charge density now charge the uh, charge the uh, total charge per unit area and let me call it sigma that is the usual notation which is uniform over the whole surface so find out the electric field now okay that is the problem and finally number 6 it's a ball charge sphere solid sphere not a football football is hollow football is this actually football is not exactly this football has a thickness so i can put a football also so that will be a problem also but okay let's forget it it's uh, kind of similar so again same radius r capital r and say there is a volume charge density now signified by rho okay and point p is here at a distance r so i want to find the electric field there find electric field i have only two options one is this the other is this this is coulomb's law this is gauss's theorem applying this so where to apply what see i am doing one thing i am not writing anything i am drawing so i am trying to pass the message that visualization is important you should be able to visualize the problem and that is the key to do this problem if you can visualize the problem looking at the system looking at the geometry you can decide which method is better and I'll tell you, for these two problems, the first one is better. Okay, there is no integration, but you know there was a summation, right? That you had this one. That uh, electric field is nothing but 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught i is equal to 1 to n qi ri square ri unit vector. Right? Just apply this in those two you will find it easier than applying this one. I will tell you. But for these other problems, this is more useful. And let me tell you, in real life, you usually have systems which have some distribution of charge in a continuous way. Point charges are very ideal thing actually. You usually have bodies which have distributed charges. I told you the point charges are actually not physically possible according to quantum mechanics and which is correct. It is not physically possible. Uh, like 
so you have some distribution so these are the real life scenarios honestly speaking and in these cases gauss's law is very useful and i'll show you something very interesting consider maybe this problem or that problem okay so that that is a ball so i consider a surface so the radius were capital r right i consider a surface which is also spherical at a distance small r so the point p is essentially a point on that spherical surface right now the point is if this is a uniformly charged sphere like this or even a spherical cell where charges can move around if they want to finally charges will stop okay just a little bit later we'll see that charges will stop moving when when they are uniformly distributed there is a reason for that we'll do it immediately after this so if they stop moving they are uniformly distributed if you draw individual lines of force electric field lines of force for each charge on here let there be infinite of them they will add up somehow whatever will happen they will add up perpendicular to the surface actually in all conducting system where there is equilibrium lines of force are always perpendicular to the surface so that's why if this is a spherical thing or i should say spherical symmetry is there i consider the surface to be spherically symmetric okay so i consider a concentric, uh, concentric sphere just that and whose radius is r so if i use the gauss's theorem then i see that my e e at each point of this surface because of this spherical cell or solid sphere both of them that will be always normal like this normal to the surface at any point so first electric field will be normal to the surface so e dot ds i can write e ds secondly this e will be same on the whole surface right so ah okay sorry i should write this yeah enclosed surface so because it is constant i can take it outside the integral and right hand side there is a q divided by epsilon not so you do that you have e direction we already then integration ds over the closed spherical surface not this surface mind you this is your gaussian surface the larger spherical surface is equal to q divided by epsilon not and you know if you integrate it it is nothing but what what's the formula for the surface area of a sphere yes 4 pi small r square is equal to q by epsilon not so e i put the vector sign again 1 by 4 pi epsilon not q by small uh, small r square this is exactly what we had earlier and we can put the direction to be the radial direction as we saw from there this is the formula we got for what point charge that was the definition of coulomb's law initially so you just remove the summation here you will get that so what is happening this electric field because of this system or this system are exactly same as if the whole charge was concentrated at the center so if there is spherical symmetry inside of the gaussian surface how the charge is distributed does not matter if the gaussian surface is spherical your system is equivalent to a point charge the point is that whether the gaussian surface is spherical or not that depends on the symmetry of the system 
because essentially what you want, you want this dot product, so there is a dot product here, right? E dot ds. This dot product to go away so that you do not need to deal with vectors. Vector has direction, very complicated. That is why in classical mechanics, you will learn it maybe in next class. Although you have Newton's laws, you apply Lagrangian or Hamiltonian formalism because there are no vectors. You do not like vectors, extra mathematics. So, we need scalars. So, we want to make the same thing. So, that is why we need the electric field to be perpendicular to the surface, Gaussian surface at each and every point. And if you do that, this dot product will go away, you will have simple multiplication. Second point is you choose the surface such that electric field remains constant also all over the surface. So, then you can do the simple integration. So, what about this problem? I am just leaving you with it. You consider a donut, not her. Yeah. You consider a donut kind of thing, such a donut surface. So, it goes around like this, right? It's a, so, it's, uh, consider it to be the axis of the donut and the radius, the minor radius of the donut. Consider, okay, let me draw like this, this will be better. Consider this to be P, yeah, H. So, basically, the minor radius of the donut consider it to be equal to H, right, the height of the point from the center, like that is the symmetry of this space, uh, this system actually. For this, consider cylinder, something like this. And just wide this, wide that up enough so that it touches P. And mind you, from the symmetry, first electric field field will be constant over this orange surface in both the cases, and electric field will be constant and perpendicular, constant and perpendicular. If those two things are satisfied, those two conditions, you can just do a simple calculation. Find out the surface area of the donut. Find out the surface area of the cylinder. So, any maybe uh, junior high school student can find out electric fields very easily. And you need to play with your intuition. And if you play with intuition, you can see here to construct a surface or something, it will be relatively difficult. It is like more cumbersome. Although, because mostly actually, because there are finite number of charges. If there are finite number of charges, it is easier to deal with Coulomb's law directly. Okay. So, that is what I wanted to tell you. So, what I suggest you solve all these six problems in both ways. Try solving in both ways. In the books, it is done actually. So, try doing it, you will appreciate uh, the use of this different mathematical formula. Okay. So, now we will go more into abstract aspects. Why I am calling it abstract that we are going to talk about electrostatic potential. So, it is everything electrostatic potential people say it is very useful and everything and all, but truly speaking it is not physical and we will see that. And because I am saying electrostatic potential is not physical, whole of modern physics is standing on it almost. That we will be talking in the last class. So, okay, I think I can wrap this off. I leave these parts. Okay, now we will talk about potential. So, I am just uh, using some mathematical result. So, this is uh, the divergence operator. If it acts on something like x minus y, but then you will ask me x is one variable, y is another variable. What variable this depends on? I have to specify it. I usually consider it to be x. Okay? So, if you differentiate with x, do it by yourself. In, I say in Griffith's book, look, 
he has done one calculation directly and I put I did not put in my notes because one should do it by their own once in their lifetime. You should know how to do it. It is not x minus y, it is modulus of x minus y. How to do it? Okay. So if you do that, the result will be minus one by yeah, r. So r this is a unit vector and r is nothing but x minus y vector. I am using this notation because it is short, nothing more than that. So this is the result. Try solving it. So basically it used to be a scalar when you uh, operated with the differential operator. It is a vector operator obviously because of that a vector direction k. So it is consistent also. Just one point, if I choose the vari uh, variable to wh with which I want to differentiate with to be y on this whole thing, this is just minus, just remember that. This thing is same as this. Try verifying it. It is like two line argument you can prove this. It is not a big deal. <laughs> Although remember, this is not sign dependent. This is a modulus. But this operation is sign dependent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what I am saying, this is not sign dependent, whether, whether x minus y or y minus x, but this thing is the whole thing. Okay. So now using this relation, the top one, you had 1 over this uh, mod square into r there, right. So I can substitute it with this. So if I do that, then I can write electric field as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught like that, but there should be a minus sign in front because there is a minus here. Yeah. So what do you see immediately? I can take this operator outside because it depends on x. If you choose this one, then also you can write it down, the minus sign will go away, but then you cannot take this outside because y is being integrated out. And it is a golden rule, if you have a differential operator in the same variable with which you are integrating also, you should first perform the differentiation, then you should integrate because once you integrate that variable goes out goes away, it is not there. So you cannot even define differentiation then. So you have to differentiate first. So to get out of that problem, I choose x differentiation. Okay. So it is out. So that means now everything else I can write inside and that I label as phi of x. And this is what is called electrostatic potential, which is the minus sign is for convention. You should not bother about that much. 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught y So that is how you de uh, derive for continuous charge distribution. If there is one single charge, it is very easy. You remember the electric field was nothing but 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught uh, yeah, Q by R square into R. So you want to find out the potential, just rub off the 2 and put a minus sign in front. That is your potential. But because there are integrals and dependent independent variable, here we have to do a trick which is this. It is like a little bit long calculation, but try by yourself. Do it step by step, you can do it. Just be careful about the signs okay? and indices. So it is said that theoretical physicists play around with uh, alpha, beta, mu, nu. Like half of the population is cosmo uh, cosmologists, so they know. So you have to really be very careful about indices. So that's a good exercise for that. So okay. So what you see that 
this is potential but more importantly the electric field is a gradient of a scalar function okay okay this operator is a vector i am not using the vector sign some people put the vector signs also but by definition it's a vector that's why i am not putting it so but this also means although i'll be using uh, results from vector calculus directly so this is one of them that curl of a gradient is zero because okay in general curl of the uh, curl of a vector with the same vector is zero because they are the same vector and curl means you do a 90 degree turn like you do a rotation you go beyond the surface and you cannot find it so for example a cross b say is equal to c okay say it is it is true if a is equal to if uh, every uh, a and b are equal then by logic this thing has to be perpendicular to okay in this uh, c is both perpendicular to both a and b b is perpendicular to both c and a and everything otherwise uh, the formula says sin theta right so if they are the same vector the angle will be 90 degree sorry uh, angle will be zero so sin zero is zero so this is zero the same logic follows to differential operators also the reverse is not true if there is a there is something true for differential operators you may not be able to apply it to vectors always but safely you can do it okay uh, so this is zero you can calculate it directly that that's why i am saying these things if you just say okay just to prove it. you can prove you again you know balance with i j k indices two three lines of calculation then you will find out okay it is zero okay fine so this is another equation and this is actually known as faraday's law of electrostatics but this is a very poor name so it is uh, it is like saying that uh, i am the aquaman of sahara desert like faraday's law is for electromagnetic induction there is no magnetism here right like there is no water in sahara desert <laughs> so something like that so here uh, just remember that in electrostatics your electric field is just curlless so that curlless like it is irrotational that means that electric field does not have any component transverse to the direction of motion that is one of the statements we will talk about maxwell's equation then you will see this this actually represents momentum if you know a little bit of quantum mechanics you know this is momentum so electric field is not perpendicular to the momentum there is no component of the electric field which is perpendicular to the momentum otherwise it cannot be zero but that is true only for electrostatics yeah yeah itself it's on it's on like if you do just a fourier transform you can always define a momentum and because it's a vector the momentum will be a three vector space vector so, so it's not yes it's fair okay. like uh, and parallel because the dot product is not zero the other gauss's law so essentially this equation and this equation these two equations they complete electrostatics honestly the whole because e is the electric field that you want to find out and all the behavior of e is given by these two equations because usually you can specify a vector uniquely unless there are some singularities and other irregularities in the space if you can define carlel divergence of the vector so you know the vector yeah right now it is not clear right now i told one thing this is this is a very bad name had there been magnetic field i could have told you but the point is that there is no motion related 
now. There is no time dependence I'm talking about. But only in the sense that later on we'll do it. We'll go to Maxwell's equation. And also at this stage, you can always do a Fourier transformation. So if you interpret the dual to x to be momentum from classical mechanics, then it will bring down a momentum, right? In that sense. Okay, so this is uh, potential. And so I said it is not physical. One reason you can automatically see here, I, we don't need to wait till Maxwell's equation. If I add with phi something, something with phi whose gradient is zero. For example, if I change phi to say phi plus say something lambda, okay. This lambda could be a constant. It's a constant, say, yeah. So that means uh, electric field will be parallel to momentum, right? If you call that, you can call that as a momentum, yeah, it, is, it will be parallel in electrostatics. There's no wave, nothing, so there's no problem. <laughs> yeah. So this is phi plus lambda. Lambda is some constant, say. So obviously, you take a differentiation, it will be zero. So this phi or this phi both will give you the same electric field. So phi, if you write to me a value like this, although you know the charge density, maybe you do the integral and everything, it is still not physical. Because electric field is physical. Why? We'll come to that very soon, a little bit. Before that, just talk about but what the value of phi means, actually. Although it is not physical, let me tell you right now that difference in phi matters. Like you have two potentials, their difference matters physically. Although the actual value does not matter. How? For that, let's find out the work done. Work done of a electrostatic system. So what is work done? So you already have an electric field. So a particle is there and it is static. So finally, you are talking about equilibrium case. There is no time dependence. So particle is sitting there, there is an electric field. So if it is sitting there, that means that's its equilibrium point. Classical mechanically, you say it is the minimum of the potential whatsoever. You can find such a configuration. Now, if you want to move that particle, if you move it, you are definitely working against the electric field because the electric field does not want it to be moved, right? That's why it was sitting there. It is static, right? So obviously the work done means work done on the particle against the electric field. So by convention of classical mechanics, it is negative. I'll put a minus sign, okay? Rest is simple. You always write an integral force distance f into dl. That is from classical mechanics. And I am co I am considering a generic uh, f uh, generic electric field which can be different at different points. So I have to do an integral, not just f dot x, because the force can be different at different points. So the safest thing is to do an integral. It's a line integral, simple line integral. So if I do that, then I apply, uh, yeah, so then maybe I'm going from point A to point B by applying that force. So that's why work has been done. So if I put it here, then force is Q E dot DL, right? I can calculate this or I can be smart. I can be smart, I can use this relation, okay? I put the potential in, so this is Q AB delta of phi dot DL. I just substituted potential, uh, use, use the Gauss's law or Coulomb's law. Rather. Now this relation is a dot product dot product with obviously this operator. So this is nothing but del del x operator in different dimension. And this is a direction, right? 
So if I choose my coordinate system such that one of the direction aligns with this, this DL, that I can always do it. I can choose my coordinate system anyhow I want to. If I consider one of the axis aligns with DL, and at each point I can do, because say the line is like this maybe, but at each point I can consider a tangential vector which is DL. Okay, so I can build up a coordinate system, something like this. So at this point, what will happen? That this will be one of the coordinates and you know the structure of this operator, right? So finally, I'll have this to be Q A to B Just this much. Just convince yourself that this is true by that local uh, coordinate argument. And this is nothing but a total derivative, right? And because it's a total derivative, because this will this will cancel finally because we are integrating over only over one variable. So it's as good as a total derivative, not a partial derivative. I hope people are comfortable with this these kind of languages. <laughs> I don't have any time to explain. So that means this is nothing but Q A to B D phi, which is Q phi B minus phi A. So what do you see? That the work done is equal to the potential difference. Uh, the Q is there, it's a proportionally constant. So it depends on the difference of potential at two different points, these end points, and on nothing else. It's a, actually a very powerful statement. It says that how the path goes from A to B, whether it goes like this or this or like this, does not matter if it's an electrostatic system. It matters on the endpoints. But something interesting you also see, this additional lambda value, which is a constant, right? That will get, uh, that will get canceled here. Because that lambda is a constant, whether the potential is at phi A or B, the uh, lambda is constant. So that will cancel out. So that information of lambda is gone. So you still don't know what is phi A and phi B, but you know its difference. How? Because this thing is physically measurable. This is the energy or work done. You can always, you know, measure how much work you are doing by pushing something. So this is potential difference. So potential difference is physical. But also you see one thing. I am having to do work to move the particle. Why? Because the electric field is pushing me. Because well, something is there to push. That's why I am having to do work. If I say there is no force, no electric field, I just say. But there are charges. There are charges but no electric field, if I say that. What that means? That I don't need to push with force. I don't need to put energy. That means this W will be zero. And W is equal to zero means phi A is equal to phi B. And what it says? That the potential at each point is the same. That is what I was talking about when I was talking about equipotential surface. What happens, say consider that sphere also, on the surface, if it is solid inside the volume, initially charges, if you put one charge here, two charges here, they will push and pull each other depending on their sign. Okay, opposite charges attract, uh, same charges repel, so they will move around. Finally, what will happen, that motion, because of friction and many other things, that will cease, that will stop. And usually for a conductor that happens when they acquire some position on the surface. Actually for three charges you can say they will be on the surface separated by angle 120 degree. This angle will be 120 degree. It will stop like this. Just it will stop like this. Because at that point they cannot escape it. That's the limit. At that point the forces along Forces, okay, not all forces are zero, but what is happening? Only forces are remaining are normal to the surface. 
all the other forces are zero like along the surface in going inside those forces are zero and why that is happening because finally at this configuration at each point potential is same so say a b c you can write a b c something like that so for each point the potential is the same right and in this config it, if it is true to exchange the charges or move around from each point to other point you don't need to put any energy so that's what equipotential surface means the charges are so arranged that electric field components cancel each other like on, along the surface the surface components of electric field at each point like something like this this they will cancel out and the system will not move so that comes from the concept of potential and potential gives you that so all conducting things actually they finally equilibrate when you talk about electrostatics finally this has happened it's a equipotential surface that's why it is waiting like this now like you can and remember that is very important if the charges are moving you cannot do electrostatics or you can do electrostatics this happens physically okay so please appreciate that point okay uh, but now there is a small twitch the twitch is that if that line from a to b is a circle or it's a complete circuit then what essentially i am saying that you are a is equal to b you are coming back to b again a again from going from a so if it is at equilibrium potentials are the same so what you will have simply w is equal to q phi a minus phi a right so that means if you move a charge how you do in electrostatics and bring back to the same point there is no work done that also means you think about it in the same way you cannot make a engine out of a electrostatic system pure electrostatic system you cannot, what? cannot make a engine what is that you know carnot cycle cannot make a engine from from electrostatic system because there is no energy in the motion there is no energy associated if you go back to the same point because the engines are reversible cycles right they come to the same point and over that cycle there is some energy which is dissipated because of which you can use it as work energy like the car can move but in such a system you cannot do anything and remember it does not need to be a circle it can be anything it can be a square or whatever like if the end points are the same or you come back to the same point work done is zero okay so finally we kind of we are slowly going away from physics now we'll go more into mathematics so if i have e is equal to minus delta phi and i also have this equation if i just substitute this in here what we have i have this much and this is called poisson equation it is very poisonous actually many interesting things comes out of here and if there is no charge charge density rather for rho is equal to 0 it is called laplace equation so had it been laplace equation your life is very easy i'll tell you if i put rho is equal to 0 so considerable solution is phi is like that it is nothing but a linear function of r uh, r vector i should say yeah if it is i put x it's a linear function of x basically it's proportional to alpha x plus beta something like that there's no other way 
there is no other. It is very easy to solve. But the moment this thing comes in, even if it is a constant, now you have to apply serious tool. That's why people want to solve uh, point uh, equation in different kind of methods. So we'll kind of take a shortcut, which is intuitive. To solve that, you again notice one thing, this relation. Yeah, we used it earlier. Ah. So this is one of the cases, but if you apply this operator again, and the moment I write square, if you replace it with y, it remains the same. Because x operation is opposite to y operation, but two times x operation is same as two times y operation, right? So just remember that. That uh, and this is uh, nebula square, which is called uh, Laplacian because of Laplace equation. Actually, so Laplace first introduced it. <laughs> okay, so now you apply it again. So what will I, why I'm doing this? I'm claiming, and I'll show you. This is the solution. Why I'm claiming? Because I have already derived it. You see the expression for phi, the point where I introduce phi what's inside the integral, there was one over this modulus, right? We derived it, we know. But there is a very interesting property. First you, we did this one earlier, we saw it is okay, fine. If you do this, then there is a problem. Naively you calculate this, what you will find? You will find zero. You just calculate this thing, or rather apply this on this side, this side, this is zero. But only in d is equal to three, I'll come to it, in three dimensional space, this is zero. But if it is zero, that means this is zero. And if this is zero, how this can be non-zero? I'm saying it is true for a general case, and I know charge density is not, not zero for points of equation. And how it is working? So it actually bamboozles physicists a lot in their time. I'm talking uh, say two to 50 years ago. And what they did, somebody did, I don't know who, very, a very cute calculation. Yeah, the calculation is that you consider this quantity. Yeah, so. I consider this one, this is like you take divergence of this, right? So divergence of r vector x minus y square, right? Yeah. Over, I am choosing this notation to be y. So you know I told you if you differentiate with respect to x, you can take it outside. But this time I don't want to do it. I want to keep it inside. So I'll just put a minus sign. Now it is good. Okay. And why I did it? I need to apply Gauss's theorem. Yeah. Ah, sorry, there is a dot product, right? Gauss's uh, divergence theorem. So it's a volume integral over V. Say this volume is bounded by a surface S, something like this. So this is surface S inside, the volume is V. If something like this, I can apply that, and that will tell me that this is just R X minus Y square D cube Y. Oh, sorry, D S vector dot. But remember one thing, this is coordinate Y. So our picture was initially that there is a volume whose points from some origin are y. So y vector is like this. And our test particle was at point P. So this is our x vector. 
and the gap was x minus y which was is equal to r vector right. So, this vector is directed like this when you integrate over y you are integrating over this volume d cube y whatever or d s whatever d s is there the surface of this volume whatever you are doing this is the y space and the moment you are doing that you are integrating you remember one thing that this d s surface and I consider this surface to be spherical I consider it to be a spherical case this uh, space because I can do it there is no limit to it this is just a mathematical construct I am not uh, considering the physical problem but why I am saying what is happening here so the surface is here I am considering to be physical and all okay so what is the coordinate here when I am uh, like dealing with this this coordinate is y the positive coordinate is y but this r inside this r is x minus y right so i if i am considering this surface element the direction of surface element this will be essentially opposite to r because y is the preliminary coordinate here and it goes like y minus r kind of thing. So, essentially here you have to be careful when you write down this surface element the surface element you can write down as minus s r x minus y square or I can write it as r square okay. and this surface element I can write it as r square d omega that we know there is a solid angle and r square that is um, the surface element, but the direction of the surface element will be minus r that you have to be careful if you integrate over x not y then there is no problem you can do it, but I am just doing it because you can see because all these integrals were over y I am choosing y to be the uh, dependent coordinate like integration coordinate. So, you just uh, do that balance or I know this argument is not that uh, clear to understand. So, you can consider it a thing that I am just taking an analogy of the with the actual physical system I am dealing with. I am basically usually integrating over this volume which is the kind of source volume I can say because this is the test point ok. And if you do that then uh, yeah. So, that argument goes. So, finally, this R will cancel out and R dot R is 1 you know then this R R will cancel. So, finally, you have what surface integral of d omega sorry surface integral of d omega and this is just 4 pi right. The uh, total solid angle over a 3 dimensional surface is 4 pi. So, it is a constant. So, what did you see this quantity is nothing but this right, but when I did a um, uh, volume integration where there is a finite spherical surface above it is giving me 4 pi and actually there is a general treatment we can uh, which can show that for any surface it will be 4 pi. If it is so then what is happening happen it is showing me that that this quantity this whole quantity is 0 only when x is not equal to y actually from here you can see if x is not equal to y you do the calculation by yourself you will find out two terms will cancel out, but each of the term will be 1 over x minus y kind of. So, if x is equal to y you are basically subtracting infinity from infinity and that contribution comes here it gives you 4 pi. So, this integral is actually I should say it is infinity. So, this is for x not equal to y this is x is equal to y that is the condition and I know that this integration is this 4 pi it is a constant. 
So there is only one possibility that this quantity, that this is just minus of this, right? Because there is a minus sign. So del square 1 over x minus y is 4 pi. just this much okay so this if you substitute inside see the expression for potential you apply with the delta x operator you will see that the i'll just write down so phi was 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught this is x rho y x minus y yeah so you apply the laplacian on x of x on here this will give you delta function and the delta function the property we discussed that delta function picks out the value of the function at that point so if you just apply del square phi, you will find minus 4 pi, oh sorry, rho by epsilon, nothing more than that. Yeah, because one minus sign will come because of this property, because I consider only the positive part, and the 4 pi will come from here, so minus 4 pi will cancel with this, and you will get this, okay. So Dirac delta function actually physically occurs in physical systems just like that. And this is a very important point that such singular objects appear in uh, electrostatics and all. So yeah, I should go fast, I forgot when I started, okay. We will be, so. Uh, do you know when I started, like uh, we started uh, at 4.45 or something? But anyhow, we are running late, I know, <laughs> we started late. Okay, fine, at least I have one more hour, so yeah, fine. Yeah, I have two classes, one of I will take a break, just uh, let me introduce a little bit. So in general, you can write, Sorry, this is not there. Yeah. Yeah. This is the general solution because this was the solution for Laplace equation. I told you it's just a constant, um, it's a linear function. You can always add it out because the Laplacian, when it will act, this will be 0. And the non trivial part is here, this one, which will give you the correct right hand side when you apply. So, Poisson equation will be solved. Just to mention one thing this whole calculation is valid only for three dimension real world because of this property that this function when I take two derivatives if it gives me 0 and infinity it gives me 0 and infinity now you do the calculation you will tre you will see there is a cancellation finally when you will do there is a cancellation like 3 minus 3 1 3 comes from the power, the other three comes from dimension, go calculating that. So that means this is not true in any other dimension. I will tell you, if you go to d is equal to 2, check by yourself, phi x is nothing but minus 1 by 2 pi epsilon naught rho y, there is a vector here. Log R. Yeah. Instead of 1 by R, this is log R in two dimension. And in one dimension, it should be minus 1 by epsilon naught, if I am not wrong. So rho y, it is simply R and dy. R is x minus y. So here it is scalar, something like that, okay. 
you check by doing the differentiation in one dimension, two dimension and three dimension, you will find it out. Finally, I will tell you if you go to the higher dimension, say d is equal to 4, above then us, uh, then it actually should look like, actually there is a general formula, I am not writing that down, 4 pi square rather, because I think the hyperspherical uh, angular integral will give you 4 pi square in in uh, four dimensional hypersphere, it should. Uh, I might be wrong, please check. This is y r square d4y, yeah, it's this much. So in three dimensional it is one by r, in four dimensional it is one by r square. So it will keep on changing. So all these treatments, all this formula depends on which dimension we live in. And you have to use at least these formulas, these two formulas, if you go to very specific electrostatic systems, which uh, have low dimension. Okay. So let me introduce you the Green's function, uh, just a little bit, then we'll take a break. Okay. So the Green's function. So again, we go to the Laplace equation, or oh sorry, Poincaré equation, which is minus rho by epsilon naught. If you have something like that, usually there is a method where you apply, if you see some operator acting on some function, right hand side, maybe a function, maybe a constant, maybe zero, whatever. If you see this quantity, you define something called a green function, like this. This can be x or y, in this case it is x, we call it 4 pi, actually this whole method born out of electrostatics, that is why people use this kind of moment scale. You can take it to be any constant and the sign can be anything, but for consistency, so that you know constants do not need to you know add up every time, so you take exactly the same thing, minus 4 pi. So this is the definition of green function. And from our calculation, we have seen that for us, g x y is equal to nothing but 1 over x minus y, modulus, just this much. That also means that g is a function of x minus y only. That also means that there is a symmetry in this system. It is rather rotational symmetry. Only the modulus of the difference of the vectors matters nothing else. So it is relatively easier to solve uh, and all those kind of things, but uh, remember this is the definition. So what I can do, instead of this 1 by r, I can put this z inside, that is the solution. Actually that is a very general way of writing down the solution of uh, any inhomogeneous differential equation like this, there is an inhomogeneous part. So you always write down it, it as uh, phi is equal to phi of x is equal to phi naught minus 1 by 4 pi, oh sorry, 1 by, yeah, 4 pi, mm, yeah, mm. you can put rho by epsilon naught each side. Uh, minus, uh, okay, let me write it like this, minus rho by epsilon naught, rho is y, g, and g is a function of r only, and d cube y, yeah, you can always write it down like this, general solution. It is just a uh, more formal way of writing down the same thing, nothing more than that. But in other cases, you do not know what g a priori, here we know because we did the calculation, we defined delta function already, you have to find it out and we will go to that uh, during Maxwell's equation, not uh, just now. Uh, so before that, I just, I uh, will just leave it now, we will come into electrodynamics. So we will stop now and uh, in the next, uh, next class, we will start with uh, Green's theorem.
So there's a good news. I decided that I will not talk about Green's theorem uh, and also the both Dirichlet and von Neumann boundary conditions. So those are used usually to solve uh, boundary value problems in electrostatics and magnetostatics. But our focus is in electrodynamics and mostly we'll be dealing with equations rather than solutions directly. So I'll just uh, finish a little bit about Green's function. So that if you remember that I said Green function solves this equation. So I'll just give you a representation, just simply like that. Usually you introduce something called Fourier transform to solve this. What is Fourier transform? You write say this gxy because I know it is x minus y, it depends on this only. So there will be some k, usually people use k and this is 2 pi cube. This constant uh, can keep on varying, that is not important. The important thing is this. Sometimes you can find it to be minus and all. Uh, so there is an inverse Fourier transform also. We will come back to it uh, when we will talk about Maxwell's equation and wave equations. And the right hand side is the delta function. And delta function has an interesting Fourier transform. That is all these things exactly same but this instead of gk you substitute one. Nothing more than that. That is your delta function. Okay. So if you substitute these two things here, what you will have inside this k integral and k is actually known as the momentum in this case. That is why I talked about the momentum of an electrostatic field. Uh, okay. So you apply this one and inside the integral what you will have in one side. So I am just using the notation k. This says this whole integral measure and everything. This will act on here. So g k no divergence will be applied on here. It does not depend on x. So divergence will, uh, sorry, Laplacian will pass through, hit on here, it will give you just minus k square. Those of you who, who do not know how this happens, I suggest do the calculation yourself. It is just a differentiation. Find out the expression for La 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 Laplacian in Cartesian coordinates, do the differentiation, you will get minus k square vector. And this will be equal to minus 4 pi same k integral and e to the power i k dot x minus y. Okay. So immediately you can see from here that your g k is nothing but g modulus of k which is minus 1 over k square. Okay. So the next goal is to substitute this result in here and do this momentum integral. Can we say yeah. delta function is a particular case of wave function? Yes. Delta function. But it is not a function. It is not. It is a distribution. So funny thing is that the, if you go to the momentum space, delta function becomes a very well behaved function. That is one constant. Oh, yeah. It becomes constant. So actually it is like uh, if you, okay, the concept is like normalization of plane waves. Just think it about. That happens if you consider something like uh, two plane waves like e to the power i k x and e to the power minus i k x. What is their product? They cancel each other out. So in one, sp one space that is okay. But if you say that is your norm, the, in the other space you will be in the problem because there will be delta functions coming in. So that is why you normalize with respect to a delta function. So it is always good to go to Fourier space because in the Fourier space in one step I know what is the solution. Difficult thing when I substitute back in here. So I want z, uh, g r say I am writing in shorthand. This is k, so d cube k, 2 pi cube, there will be a minus sign, 
over k modular square it will be i k dot x x minus y. So, you can go to spherical polar coordinates do the angular integral separately then do the radial integral and the radial integral with 1 by over k square. Actually, it is like if you go to the measure of this quantity. So, this d cube k did I write d cube k yeah. So, d cube k is nothing but k square d k d omega you know sin theta d theta d phi that is it. So, this k square will be cancelled with this. So, it seems easier, but this quantity is there you have to handle with this and you have to do complex integration you are learning complex analysis right. Thiti took the classes right. So, did he do residue theorem and all ok. So, you should be able to do that. Yeah. So, yeah if you do it finally you will find this just this much as the result. Oh, GR is just this one. This is R, right? Oh. I'm writing that notation. Okay, fine. Then let's find out the energy of the electrostatic field. That is important. I was talking about before. So the energy is kind of simple. It was. Let me just write down. So, you remember the work done calculation we did E dot DL you remember that work done was like there was a minus sign then Q E dot DL then to find out this potential uh, uh, I put uh, sorry I uh, use the expression for potential then we find out it is the potential difference right. So, in general at a particular point if that is the work done that means at a particular point A or B I wrote the energy is Q into phi nothing more than that. So, this is the energy of the now there is no minus sign. So, I am talking about energy I am not talking about work done this is the energy of the electrostatic field because of a potential phi on a charge Q i it is effectively the charge which is experiencing the electric field ok or rather the potential it is experiencing. And uh, from the summation uh, like uh, I can write it down uh, like this that if this is because of the charge distribution I have this q i and then 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught j 1 to some n minus 1 why I am writing this I will tell you. Wait. Okay, fine. I'll tell you what they are. Get the vector, then Q J. Okay, what is happening is here. Let there be n charges. Q one, Q two, Q three up to n. Okay. So, each charge will feel the electric field because of the other charges or other potential because of the other charges. So, I am just writing the potential all potential because of the other charges. So, the potential will depend on the individual charges and the difference between um, distance from that charge to this I charge ok. So, that is why this summation, but one particle less because I am considering this particle. So, what is the field because of the other n minus 1 particles? So, that is why this n minus 1 comes in. So, this is the individual energy for each charge q i. So, what is the total energy of the system? Obviously, I have to sum over all this. So, that is w is equal to summation i w i. So, if you do that, and i will go from 1 to n for each charge. So, this summation is now 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught i to n. Now, j goes from 1 to n, but remember j is not equal to i. So, the notation is this and it goes to n minus 1 then q i q 
qj xi minus xj so this is the notation okay okay but there is something this is n this is n minus 1 and all hmm. i want to make both summations equivalent so what is happening here say consider this example say n is equal to 3 i am considering so each of them is the system so they are not system together each of them is the system i am just drawing it to show you so if i consider the pairs how you count the pairs that for this this one and this one this cannot be a pair right then for this this and for this this and this so how many of them you see six but the system is this only or this only not both there are two copies of the same system so you are already over counting so that means you have to divide by half actually there are three pairs possible one two two three three one right so that's why what i can do i can put this is equal to from j to n i can write it as half one over four pi epsilon naught i comma j both going to n but just one little thing i must write that i is equal to j term i am neglecting that i can write explicitly here also that i is not equal to j why it is the famous self energy that i talked about in the first class itself that when this is zero it will be infinite and we are not considering those things those are out when i is not equal to j just remember that so this factor of 1 by 2 came in right okay so now we can generalize this thing so go to continuous distribution substitute summation with integration that's why i have to make them the same so if i may, uh, make them to be integration then i have 1 by 8 pi epsilon not integration over say some x y so d cube x d cube y rho of x rho of y x minus y yeah simply this much okay then you can consider any of the integrations say consider the y integrations just this part and with 1 by 4 pi epsilon in the front that is exactly the potential right that is potential so this is 1 by 2 d cube x rho x phi of x is this much yeah this is just this much now uh we had the poisson equation right what poisson equation said that del square phi is equal to minus rho by epsilon naught right that one so i can substitute rho here with del square phi right so uh this so minus so it will be minus epsilon naught divided by 2 d cube x this much x vector remember phi is a scalar function but it depends on vector what is a scalar okay fine so now i can play a game i can shift a total derivative you know this game right uh, just uh, let me write that if you have something like this that uh, say del del x of a b dx something like this you can write it down as minus a del del x b dx 
you can always do it. This is one dimensional log, this is three dimension, but you can always do it. Given on the surface of this whole integral at the end points, the field vanishes. Because you know I use the chain rule actually. So by writing here, actually I should write one more time a term that is del x a b dx. Or one variable I should write total derivative. Yeah, I can write total derivative. Yeah, total derivative. If I do that, so this is just a boundary type term. So this is the AB value on the boundary. And we said on the boundary they vanish because these fields are localized. So usually electric field or potential is something like that. at this point you will find something. At very far distance you don't have anything. If you find something at infinities, what will happen? That means you have infinite energy and infinite, infinite everything. You don't like that. There is nothing infinite in this world. And if there is, we cannot measure it, right? <laughs> so because of that, we use that. I can shift this one of the uh, gradient operator from this Laplacian to this one. If I do that, the minus sign will be gone because of that minus sign. This is simple silent by 2. I can write it like this. But it is uh, gradient of phi, dot gradient of phi. That will be the small square. And what is this? This is negative of electric field. Right? That is the definition of potential. So I finally have energy of the electrostatic field is epsilon naught by 2 integration d cube x modulus of electric field x square. And that is why I said potential is not physical because electric field is. Electric field gives you energy. But am I exactly correct? There is one catch. The phase, it is a modular square. You can take electric field to be a complex function and which it actually is if you it satisfies a wave equation that we will see later. Then the phase information is gone because it is a mod square. But at least the modulus of the electric field is physical. Something is there but potential is not because electric field is. Because given the electric field potential can take many values that constant shift I did right. So that is the gauge independence actually or redundancy of the system and for that that is what every interaction theory is electrodynamics, gravity, whatever happens inside the nucleus all has this property that some variable is there which is actually very important that is the actual variable with which you can do calculation and we will see this in Maxwell's equation. The actual mathematical variable of the system is the these potential fields there will be a vector potential also but they are not physical. So that is a very big conundrum in um, physics and that gives you many important things actually many fascinating things that is why we love it but also it is a problem <laughs> okay more about it later. Okay, so the last topic I about electrostatic I want to discuss is the dipole moment uh, of the system. So I will just uh, go through very sketchily about dipole moment. Okay, dipole. Actually, I want to tell you about uh, electrostatic induction. So what is induction? Basically, if you put something in an electric field, some material, you know in the material there are electrons and also nucleus which is positively charged. So along the electric field the positive and negative charges of the system get spread out and it spreads out in a way that it will they will get separated a little bit. So their electric fields will no more cancel out each other completely. Like in an atom you have classically at least you have electrons everywhere and at the center you have the nucleus total charge is the same, they are neutral. So the electric field cancel out, so you have neutral objects. The moment you put it in an electric field there will be a deformation, so the positive charge and negative charge will be separated a little bit and it will create its own electric field which will actually counter 
the applied electric field. That is actually uh, that is uh, because of why it will counter it or oppose it to preserve energy. Otherwise, you will have infinite energy again. So it will be opposite, and that is called induction. And that separation happens. The simplest configuration is called dipole. That's why I want to talk about dipole. So one way to look at dipole is very simple. Like from what we have done already, it is simple. So you have this expression phi of x that one pi four pi epsilon naught dq y rho y and the modulus downstairs I will write it is like this. Yeah, I will write it like this. Yeah. Electric field. Yeah, it is. Like you see the solution of Helmholtz equation or any wave equation, classical wave equation. I'm talking about Maxwell's equation. So it is del square A is equal del square E is equal to zero say. What's the solution? It's a general solution e to the power i k dot k dot uh, i k dot x in k k mu x mu, right? So there is i, so it is complex in that sense. Physically you observe only the real part. That's why you can consider it to be real also. But the solution, if you say it satisfies the wave equation, it has to be complex, or you can take parts of it, like sine part or cos part. So it depends on your choice. And is it like the existence of dual? Yeah, it's dual. It will give you the same thing. The, the actual point is the physical object is the modulus only. So you can take complex or real solutions, anything. But when you talk about the potentials, potential there is a problem. I might talk about it later. Potential has to be real, at least for E1 gauge fields, Maxwell theory. Okay, but uh, mm. the way we are introduced to gauge, mm. uh, it's not like that. Yeah. There, you do not encounter any uh, complex. You do not say you start with the concept that your AMU is real. Okay. You just assume, uh, say, and go on. But why you do that, that actually becomes clear later on. Like what happens uh, if you start with AMU like that and you calculate energies and everything, energies comes as you know bilinears in AMU. Some operator sandwich between AMU and AMU. Now if AMU is not real, that quantity is a complex. Okay. So in principle we should yeah. allow both complex and real. Potentials has to be real. Okay. Electric or magnetic field can be complex. So physics demands that potential is not physically observable and phase of the electric or magnetic field is not physically observable. But you can see direct effect, indirect effects, interference. Then again says okay, the phase means actually the absolute phase you cannot observe, you can see phase difference, like you can see potential difference. So at that level they are the same. But at the functional level potential is real field can be complex in general. So, curvature, yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Is curvature. Yeah. Field and yeah. So, for, curvature is real. Curvature is yes, real. it's uh, no, like the potential formula, it's like real derivatives acting on potential, right? It has to be real. Okay. But when we relate it to electric field and magnetic Yeah. So, then only the modulus will come in that. So you might think about you know constructing electric field equivalence for gravity. My question is, yeah. No, no, no. You don't need it, but in general it can be. What I'm saying. Yeah. No, no, no. That will not add to more gas. Okay, we'll talk later. <laughs> Let me finish it. <laughs> that will not. Okay, physicist, that happens. Okay, then uh, the dipole moment, if I write it like this, now what I want to do, I consider this, uh, this situation that y is very, very less than x. y modulus, I should say x modulus. So, what I'm physically saying that you remember this one, this is y, this is x at point P, and this is x minus y. This system. So I am saying that it is my reference point is very much near. 
Maybe it is inside, I don't know. Very near, so it is very small. So if that is the case, I can do a Taylor expansion. So practically I can take this x square outside, so it will be 1 by x modulus and it will be 1 divided by x square divided by x square. Then I do it in um, binomial expansion from there because all the arguments are less than 1. I do a bar binomial expansion, you just do it, you learnt it in school. So it will finally give me uh, So if I do it inside, then finally I'll give 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. First term is kind of clear. Sorry, it is not rho x, this is q. Because there will be only this one term actually, you'll go up, that one term will be just integral of rho over d equal y, that is q. Second term is interesting, that is 1, 4 pi epsilon naught x cube x vector dot rho y y vector d q y plus order y square terms. So there will be higher order terms. Actually the second term is quadrupole. First term is this is called dipole. This term is called dipole term. This term is called quadrupole means the first y square order term. Then we'll keep on going then octopole then whatever. This is essentially called a multipole expansion, like multipole, okay, there is a pole here, pole expansion, okay, and uh, yeah, so this quantity is called P. This is called dipole moment. This is called dipole moment. Okay, so you can expand it like this: p dot x divided by x cube, and all you can do it. So what happens that if you are in a medium, what this dipole? It is charge density into a length. So it is essentially if you separate out two charges like positive and negative some charge the length it being separated out you multiply with this that is what is called dipole moment mathematically physically it shows that it, it serves the whole thing serves as a charge it serves as a charge the whole thing serves as a charge additional charge apart from this q so the whole system breaks up as a point charge q then some dipoles, then higher terms will give some octo, uh, quadrupole, octopole, and that way it, get, it will get separated. Uh, so now we'll again generalize it even more than that. So now I am considering this is one dipole, just one dipole. Now consider a system where many, many dipoles are there, like an atomic system where individual atom becomes a dipole when you apply a electric field. If you do that, you have to do a summation over all this again. And I can write down phi as, I'm going really, really fast, I don't want to, but. So instead of Q, here Q, you again write a charge distribution. I don't hide it anymore. Uh, this is Y, dQ Y. See, don't confuse with this derivation with this derivation. This is something entirely new. I'm generalizing that. So these coordinates are not the same, exactly. What I'm saying here is that there is a charge distribution in a medium, individual charge distribution, and there is a dipole distribution, which is totally separate. That situation I'm considering about. Here, there is only one charge distribution. From there, I found out monopole contribution, which is this. It is called monopole because this is dipole and the dipole contribution separately. But here I am considering that both of them stays, uh, exist separately. So this you know from a charge distribution, the potential term, then plus there is a dipole contribution which is uh, 
1 over 4 pi epsilon naught ui dot x minus y cube and d cube y and I am considering there is no higher order poles or anything. So, just convince yourself that this is a generalization of that. So, I am inside a medium now. Now, you see this quantity, this is just the negative divergence of 1 over modulus x minus y. You remember this equation that minus I am writing q because at top there is I am not writing the unit vector, I am writing the whole vector. You can write it square and r, this is r unit vector, right? Okay, you can do that. So I can plug that back in here. Then I can notice one thing that this is okay, this will be with respect to y. Oh, this is plus because this is y, y coordinate. I want y. So this will be plus. So if I put that back in here, I can actually shift the total derivative that you see, you imagine instead of this quantity, this quantity is there, then this derivative I will shift it here. Okay, let me write down. So, the first term plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught p, oh no, yeah, p dot, I am not writing the first term, dot delta y 1 over x minus y, yeah, d q y. Right. Now, I want to shift this to here. I can do it because the total derivative will vanish. All fields are localized and this is a physical system definitely. It's a medium. So, if I do that, there will be a minus sign and this will hit here. Right. So, this will be minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Okay, I have this. Yeah. No, the boundary of the medium that uh, in the medium I am considering a physical medium which will be finite. Yeah, there will be a boundary time uh, term coming in. There should be. Actually, I missed out. Uh, I did not discuss about uh, all these Green's theorems and boundary conditions and all. So it can get really complicated in there. But I am considering on the boundary. At least on the boundary, what is happening? This uh, charge density and all, the, sorry, the dipole moment has died off. Usually, what happens on the boundary of, say, a conductor? If I take the there is a boundary potential which is so strong, usually it will not let the charges to deform into dipoles in the boundary. So the dipole moment is uh, vanishingly small there. But that's a very strict assumption. We take that assumption for now. But you can consider a more complicated case also. So there will be a boundary contribution. You are right. Thank you. In general, so okay. So left hand side, I can write minus delta e of x. Right. Uh, this is phi. Uh, one second here. There was something. Wait. 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 Wait, no, I will write in one step. So, this will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That term was there. So, I can write rho minus del dot p. They depend on y, all of them. Then x minus y d q y. And this was phi of x. Now, let me take the Laplacian and to write down the Poisson equation. If I take the Laplacian, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Laplacian. If I take that, uh, the Laplacian is actually that is negative of uh, del dot e. Nothing but that. So that will just come as del dot e x zero minus this equal to. But that Laplacian will hit on here, and this is just the delta function minus 4 pi delta phi. So, that will kill this minus 
and finally we will have that rho by epsilon 1 by epsilon naught rho minus naught t and remember everything is in terms of x because of that delta function right so this is this is the result because i am saying this laplacian will hit on this quantity only on this quantity because it is on x it will hit on this quantity and it will give you a delta function basically minus 4 pi delta function so that minus 4 pi will cancel out this minus so you will have 4 pi there was 1 by 4 pi that will cancel out so you will have 1 over epsilon not only so remaining part is there of x early it was y now it will become of x so we finally have this thing that so you remember something you remember the gauss's law it was exactly like this sorry that epsilon naught is not there because that will get shifted yeah it was somewhat like this because if you put p is equal to 0 this is gauss's law nothing else okay we just applied the same law with the potential so it you should be similar as gauss's law but there is an extra part p here and i just took the epsilon this side so this is called d d vector or displacement vector yeah it can be confusing uh, why it comes this is ac the actual electric field which is the resultant of the original electric field and the reaction electric field coming from the medium and in the presence of the medium this is the most general configuration that the polarization will add as a electric field that is why polarization uh, dipole moment is important polarization not polarization i should say dipole or you can talk about dipole polarization also see e and p might not have the same direction also so why not ah if the system is free you say you have an atom say something like this you apply the electric field like this this atom will get elongated like this along the electric field right so in that case p and e have the same direction but say if you are in a medium there are other atoms also and some different kind of atoms also it's an inhomogeneous medium then it might not get elongated along this direction maybe a little bit like this so this is will be your direction of p this will be your direction of e that might be the case but it usually happens for inhomogeneous medium so in general that is the case so this is actually the complete first equation of maxwell's yeah. we'll come to that tomorrow that's the complete one usually we actually neglect it Thank you. Thank you. So everything is finished. Only two classes are left. So everybody is happy. I can see that. Uh, and usually if that is the situation what happens nobody concentrates in the last classes yeah. <laughs> what happens, i know uh, so yeah i know so usually what happens that uh, you should uh, organize uh, nothing kind of topics for the last uh, few classes that actually you should plan to finish in the morning on the last day and for the afternoon classes you just keep something that you would, even if you don't teach does not matter something like that <laughs> okay so seriously so you people believe that you learned something in this uh, school in this camp like it, it is beneficial no i'm not asking that whether you have learned everything or not i'm just asking is it beneficial for you okay hopefully so usually what we used to do when we were students that in such kind of a school we used to, you know, just write down everything, just gather information because there is no time to understand. Later on, if you follow up your notes, 
you might be able to understand even more you might be able to appreciate more the things here half of the things even most of the things looks like jargon that i know and especially mathematics mathematics looks real boring if somebody doesn't give you time and just gives you mathematics after mathematics equations after equations so yeah chandra came i think we will not wait for burin because uh, he's not a student <laughs> okay so let's start uh, so today i will be a little bit fast yesterday we finished at electrostatics uh, today i will just introduce magnetostatics and go into electrodynamics directly so so now there is no electric charge but there is a current and it so happens that you cannot have a current unless there is electric charge so there is electric charge and that's why when you talk about magnetism you cannot leave electricity out of it because there is no other source for magnetism apart from electric charge so that means i am talking about current so current is just rate of change of charge and if i introduce a charge density then it is d cube x yeah that much now you notice you check yester last notes yesterday's notes charge density rho was always a function of x now i am putting in t so deliberately what i am bringing in i am bringing time dependence so actually this name is not correct static means time independent but you cannot do magnetism without introducing time because current is a fundamental quantity current gives rise to electricity uh, magnetism if you don't no how the current arises then it's a different thing if you don't know how the current arises because you can see if i take the differentiation obviously it's a function of time right so it can happen that charge is a linear function of time then current can be a constant quantity and for a constant current can there be magnetic field actually there can be magnetic field but it won't do any work that we will see so you can uh, so if you forget about electric charge you can say there is a current and we have magnetic field so we do magnetostatics because my current is constant but physically that is never possible there is always time dependence so okay uh, but current can always also be written as like this that i talked about yesterday so if there is some surface means current will flow through something right if it flows to through something say in this direction and if it's a three dimensional body obviously you can always have a perpendicular surface to it so you define a vector called current density which when you take multiply with the surface area which is a small one you get current but surface area in three dimensional space is a vector so this current density has to be a vector and it causes a lot of uh, confusion current is not a vector but current density is and people um, sometimes very fast they change from current to current density people say okay current density is the current per unit area but one is scalar one is vector so you have to be careful when you define we'll come to it okay and uh, because these are two same expressions you can combine them right but with some physics you see that this current is flowing through a surface that means if there is a volume like this behind it is carrying charge out so charge here is decreasing okay because current is going out so if i take the current to be positive then what will happen
that's why you have a minus sign here this will be a minus sign so what i can do i can play around with gauss's divergence theorem this quantity i can write as divergence of j d cube x you remember that this one you can remember and from there today everybody is sitting wide okay i'm moving around it's okay so now they are over some volume which can be any volume right so because it can be any volume it's arbitrary so if they are equal the integrands are equal so finally we have this one that del dot j plus del rho del t is equal to 0 and this is called equation of continuity so i have shown it for uh, charge and current but this is true for anything we will later see it is true for even electromagnetic field energy also if i can show it today so it actually represents it's called equation of continuity but it represents conservation conservation means something flowing out is equal to something decreasing so you always have that situation with you like a bottle of water maybe or maybe temperature or anything so it's a very fundamental quantity and it is also known as the conservation equation what is conserved okay total energy is conserved or total amount or total flux whatever something is conserved okay and later on we will see that this will also is a very fundamental expression which is used for gauge fixing also so people who know this is covariant gauge it is covariant gauge i'll come to that i talked about gauge gauge independence a little bit but i'll come to it again okay first so fine so there is something called biot severt law so i don't know the actual pronunciation he was a french french guy he might be knowing <laughs> can you guess what is the pronunciation the yeah Okay, B O. Without T. Bio. B O. Without T. Savar. Bio Savar. Bio Savar. Okay, good. See. <laughs> so that law says that say if you have a current carrying wire, so there is a current going on, I, in this direction, and we consider a small element of the wire small portion of the wire so that it's almost straight there is no curvature in here and a point p away from it say this distance is x okay for here and d and this element is dl so which is in the same direction of the current so the magnetic induction i'll call it magnetic induction actually it is equal essentially it is magnetic field but traditionally it is not called magnetic field or i might call it field also but officially it is induction don't ask me why uh, people used to give different names 300 years ago again the formula is okay this is an experimental formula so they fix the constant somehow So this is a cross product between this length element and this vector, position vector of point P from here. So, so the origin is situated in the middle point of somewhere here. That is our reference frame. So this is P and this cross product gives you the magnetic field. And this is also inverse square, you can see. Because I'm using unit vector here. So there is no dimension as such. So it is inverse square law, like electrostatics, same. And what will be the direction? If you use your uh, uh, left hand rule, you will see the cross product will be perpendicular to both L and X. So this is DB, direction of D. So that means if you have a current going on like this in a circle, the magnetic field will actually upwards. Or if it is a straight line, magnetic field will be actually around that line. 
So it's like helical. If you have that's a wire, this will be magnetic field, like this. So that we all know, like electromagnets work like this, and everything. So this is for one element, and for all the elements, you just integrate it uh, mu naught by four pi. Then just integrate it i dl cross x x square. I'll write it in a shorthand, like x square, same thing. Now here you can see this is dl into i, and this i quantity, this dl, is along the direction of current. Right? If that is the direction of current, but current is not a vector actually. <laughs> That's why it is confusing. But you can say the current is flowing like that. So what is a vector? It is the current density. So obviously, if the current is going like this, current density is in same direction. Okay. So this I D L. Uh, let me write this I D L. I can write it as J D S D L. This is not a mathematical expression. This is actually a physical expression. It says because I will have a current density, right? The I will have a current density. What is I? I is J dot D S. And if you notice here, D S means the cross section of the wire, and J is perpendicular to D S. So J dot D S is nothing but J into D S. I can forget about the vector notation. There is an uh, angle is 90 degrees, so it's just simple multiplication equivalent to. But I know this vector sign, DL vector, the vector direction is same as J. So both share the same unit vector. So I can actually shift this vector sign to J. If you multiply a scalar, uh, sorry, if you multiply a vector and a magnitude of another vector, but both vectors have the same sign, say, a and B, B say is a vector, but A and B are parallel. A is the magnitude of vector A. If you multiply like it, you can always write it like this. Does not matter. It's the same quantity. So I just did that. So that's why I'm saying it is not mathematical, it is physical. You know it will happen like this. Because of this construction that J is perpendicular to the surface area. So J dot DS, I can write J DS. Okay. So I can do that. And ds into dl is what? It's a volume integral. That is the integral of this whole wire's volume. And this wire, you can take the integral, you can expand it over whole space, doesn't matter. It does not matter, like you can expand. You can say that, okay, the wire goes to finite extent, the other part will just contribute to zero. But there is nothing, there is no wire. Like if this is the wire, if I integrate only this volume and something inside, and if I say that, okay, I'm integrating over the whole space, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. Because outside this wire, there is nothing. Such that there is no current density outside this wire. So if I integrate over the whole wire's volume, if I integrate the current over whole wire's volume, or I integrate the current over whole space, it will give me the same result. Because the extra space I'm integrating over, there's no current. So there's no contribution. So I can very well say this is the integration over whole space. Because there is no other current. Right? So this quantity I can write it as mu naught by four pi j Sorry, x square. No, no. Yeah. Okay, this is one notation, just remember it. Then, uh, okay. So, how these all equations came up? This was uh, through experimentation when you have some loop carrying current. And you try to measure, uh, because it will be a loop, you have to close the circuit, right? If you don't close the circuit, there won't be any current. So usually there is a current carrying loop, there is some battery somewhere maybe, that not needed. 
and they tried to measure the magnetic field near it. How? They put a another magnet, some magnetic compass, some needle maybe, something like a needle. It used to flicker if you change the current here, something like that. They, uh, that, is, that was Michael Faraday actually. So uh, he checked it like this. Yeah? Actually Ampere, you are right. Ampere started it. What Faraday did, Faraday did a series of experiments. Like uh, he used uh, another circuit, he used a magnet, uh, a compass, he used maybe a, another solenoid near about, he did all the experiments. But Ampere, you are correct, Ampere was the first person who actually uh, checked this. So usually you have full circuit. So what they observed that um, usually if you put, you do the other thing, like for either you measure the magnetic field near a circuit or you put a circuit in the magnetic field, both cases you will feel a force. If you take a current carrying circuit and move in a magnetic field, you will feel a force. The circuit will rotate itself. That is, uh, that is your electric motor, right? You take a magnet, so, a solid uh, but hollow magnet, put a coil inside, the coil will rotate if you send current. So magnet near a circuit will feel force, circuit in a magnet will feel force everything experiments. They saw and they found out that okay, there is a force felt by the uh, circuit which is, I would say this is I1, I will mention what it is, DL cross B. So what is happening? There are two circuits like this, circuit 1, circuit 2, both carrying currents. And what they observe that there is a force, uh, let me draw the diagram that will be clear, yeah. So circuit 1, the current flowing like this, the arrow represents current and this is DL1, so yeah, that is the element and there is another element DL2 in circuit 2 where the current is now uh, clockwise. Okay, and the distance between them, I am calling it x12 and the direction I am taking from 2 to 1, okay. So the question is that forget about this circuit first, uh, is it, uh, yeah, yeah, forget about this circuit, the structure, remember just that there is only a current I1, there is a current I1 and here there is a current I2, okay. So if there is a current going on here, only the current and there is some magnetic field. What magnetic field? Because of this I2, which is I am talking, calling B, okay. This is actually generated by this formula. So there is a current flowing I2 because of which there is a magnetic field B and that magnetic field is affecting this one. And experimentally they found a force and that force is proportional to the current flowing in this circuit. Remember this is the force experienced by this one, okay. So DL, yeah, that is kind of confusing, yeah. So this is DL1 cross B. So this element feels this much of force because of this circuit 2, okay, yeah. Direction of current, oh, why they are opposite? Uh, yeah, that matters. That matters uh, because uh, the thing is that this B, here if you see that direction and this, uh, this direction are opposite, I am just uh, taking it, but uh, actually if you take the cross products, later on we will check. Uh, let me write, then you will see. So this is DL1 into B and B is the magnetic field because of this and these are all experimental. But B we know from here, right? So that I can write down as 
So force, if this is force, sorry, one little thing, I have to integrate over the whole circuit to find out the total force over the whole circuit, circuit one. So there will be integration, th that much. So this is I1 dl1 cross, but B is because of this, so that formula will come in, mu naught by 4 pi, integration, integration, so there will be I2, I can put I2, then DL2 cross X, 1, 2, you need, yeah, square. I, I just substituted this formula, I think more than that, but with 2, 2, 2 everywhere. And this, this vector is the distance between, uh, the, uh, between the circuit and the point. So here, this is the circuit point, this is here. So this is like kind of, uh, this is like P, so I'm considering from here. For each point, I have to consider. So I wrote it down, okay. Okay, fine. Then uh, after you write it down, then we will, take out the constant factors, I1 into I2. See, I1 and I2 are independent of anything, they are constants. We are assuming it's a constant current. That means we are assuming it's uh, equilibrium. And here, you have a vector triple product, DL1, DL2, and X12, unit vector. So if you do that, you uh, expand in the formula of vector triple product, that will be, um, Oh, I need to mention that these are all closed integrals, okay? Because these are closed circuits. So two closed integrals. Then the formula is for DL1 cross DL2 cross X, that will be DL2 DL1 dot X12 minus So that is the formula. This is the vector triple product formula. Nothing more than that. And now you notice one thing. This, uh, yeah, the first term here, this first term, this is DL1 into x12, this dl1 over x12. So, but there is a dot product. Again, this is any vector taking a dot product with a line element. So, this is like, say you have some, say dx, dx direction if you take multiplying with the r position vector, something like this. This will be nothing but dx into x, dx into x, x, x dx. It will be something like this, right? A position vector multiplying a line element, line element vector, if you take a, this is a dot product, right? So it will just project the position vector, position vector along the element. So this will be something like this. So if I am calling the line element x, because I can take my axis along this. So it is just project the coordinate. So x dx is a total derivative, you know, this is half dx square. So that will happen here. And the moment it happens, there is an integral over dl1 and dl2. So there is an integral 1, integral 2. So over the one integral, it's a total derivative, right? Hmm? But you will ask me that this bugger is there. This bugger is there. Then what is happening? But then you remember there was a relation with divergence. That this is x unit vector, if you remember, x unit vector divided by say x, yeah, x square, then x something, sorry, yeah. This was minus one by x if you remember this formula. 
remember it was modulus yesterday if you remember so if this is the formula i can write this term this by this as a divergence now the divergence will multiply with this and that will be again a total derivative so essentially this quantity is a total derivative this quantity is a total derivative over the one integral so this will be zero we assume that at the boundary there is nothing actually it's a line integral it's a round up right so total integral will give a value evaluated at the same point so it will be zero no it means that integration uh, what is uh, uh, close control integration that means you are going from here to again point uh, same point so boundary value means you evaluate the same point uh, same value at the same point and subtract it so boundary point is the same point so it will cancel out it will be zero so the over first integral this term will be zero so only the second term will contribute and the second term if you write down that will be simply minus mu naught by 4 pi i1 i2 1 and 2 okay just this much so that is the force that is the formula for the force because of one circuit on the other and the reverse is also true because you can see if you interchange one and two there is n there is no difference here this term had a difference in one and two and but this term is zero so that actually makes sense physically because if there are two circuits one forcing the other the opposite force would be the same so it shows that so that is one expression yeah so fine but for magnetic field remember we expressed in another way in terms of current density so you can actually without going into this step you can stay here and you can do one another grip this term itself you can write it as j cross b d cube x you can write it like this the way i did it here same argument because there is a current a current multiplying line element i can exchange it as current density multiplying a volume element so this circle goes into a volume integral just like there so usually practically what expression we use we use this expression and this expression that is more useful for us okay fine uh, yeah so if you consider now this particular expression if you take and uh, okay let me write it again in a way that b is equal to mu naught by 4 pi d cube x i'm bringing in this uh, r vector just that uh, it's the same thing you can call it ix or r r is if you remember it's a difference between x and y so i can write this to be function of x this function of this is integration y that's the notation i was using so r is nothing but x minus y long notation so it will be something like this because here it is uh, something like that i call this point x i call this point y like yesterday so it will be same nothing more than that and smaller unit vector is the unit vector in that direction but we know that we can write it as a divergence this whole thing i can write it as a divergence over x right that same formula if i do that this will be mm -hmm. yeah 
this will be just del x not by 4 pi j y by r d q by. So, the formula was that uh, this quantity acting on here, oh there is a minus sign, just there is a minus sign, yeah. So, del x acting on 1 over r modulus will give you r unit vector divided by r square. So, that was a formula yesterday we uh, uh, used it. So, for, oh I should not write cross, it is just gradient, okay. So, b is a gradient of some function. So, immediately you can write down one very important thing that curl of b is equal to 0. Because you take a curl of a diver, uh, gradient, it is always 0. Because it is a curl of the same, uh, cross product with the same vector essentially. And this is a very important thing. This says the magnetic field when you take the curl it does not have any transverse component. But this is true only if we, if you do not have free charges. In this system we do not have any char free charge till now, yeah. Any uh, transverse component. So, if you take curl, okay transverse means I am taking this is usually the direction of motion of momentum. So, momentum cross product with B vanishes. That means, there is no component of B perpendicular to the momentum. Otherwise, this cross product would not have been 0. That will contribute, but it is not the case now. But this is true only when we are not considering, oh sorry, 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 my mistake. One second. What I am writing? Sorry, 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 sorry. One second. Not cross. There is a cross product already, sorry, I removed it, my mistake. So, this will mean just, yeah, sorry, there is no transverse component, there is only longitudinal component, sorry. It is a cross product, I totally, totally, you know, misread it, sorry. So, that is why if you dive, take a divergence of a cross product, it is 0. So, it means a very important thing, the statement is reversed now, that, that there is no longitudinal component only transverse component. There is no component along the momentum. This means that is one thing, but the second thing it means that there is no source to magnetic field, there is no magnetic charge. Source means current is a source, okay physically you say, but source means what I mean there is a static source like electric charge for electric field, there is no magnetic charge. If you remember for electric field the corresponding equation was something like this. because there is electric charge. Physically what it means that if there is a charge, lines of force will spread out from the charge and divergence actually measures the spreading out. Basically how much that field is varying if you change space. If it is spreading out obviously field is changing, right. So, it is non-zero. So, divergence means that there is a point from where it spreads and if divergence is 0, there is no point. So, there is no charge, magnetic charge and it is a perfect Maxwell's equation. It does not get changed in electrodynamics also, like this quantity got changed if you remember, it went into, yeah, with displacement vector. But if you take magnetic field and put it in a medium also, this also holds true or other magnetic induction that there is no magnetic charge. It cannot be, it always stays uh, there. It is called Gauss's law of magnetostatics sometimes, but it basically says that it is a statement that there is no magnetic charge. And also because it will prevail in electrodynamics also, magnetic field is always transverse to the direction of motion. And what is the thing that is moving? Okay, we do not know it because we are doing statics, quote unquote statics, but we are not talking about any motion of the field. Okay, so that immediately means one more thing that if the dive, if that is the case, 
if this is the case obviously we have seen that b is a curl right we have seen that b is a curl and if b is a curl i can name this thing something Or this one. So, because the expression for B, I could write it as a curl of something. So, if I take a divergence, it will be 0. So, that means that first of all, that uh, there is no divergence. That means that this field does not spread out from a point. You will never have this. That means there is no point. There is, there is no point charge for magnetism. Always it will be some loop, circular loop or something like that. Secondly, if there is some motion of this field, this operator usually gives you momentum because you go to momentum space that I, k dot x, you take the differences and k will come down. So this is, if this is k in momentum space, then k dot b is 0, means along the momentum there is no component. So, magnetic field is always transverse. So, those are the two points that we will see when we will talk about Maxwell's equation very soon. Uh, okay. And uh, so, okay, you see there is something lying around here that we will talk about. But before that, you notice one thing that if I take curl of B, not divergence, but curl of B, so this will be. Wait a second, let me check one thing. Mm. In this I put curl of x. Mm -hmm. There is a sign problem. Oh, 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 okay. So, in, di in this diagram, what is happening? I am finding out the magnetic field here and the vector I am taking from here to here. So, this is my reference point. You see your lectures in uh, electrostatics. The reference point P, where I was finding electric field, the vector was directed towards it. Now it is, one second, uh, let me see the figure again. Yeah. So it is directed towards it, right. Now if I am calculating magnetic field and I, if I am writing this thing, where I am integrating this over? I am integrating this over this y direction. This whole thing I am integrating is over this y, right means that is that is the code, x is the coordinate from here, where of p, I am saying it is the x is the coordinate for, from p. But what will happen that I will integrate over this whole quantity. So this vector, this point will stay fixed, that I am saying that this point will stay fixed, this will keep on shifting. Okay. So what will happen that this x vector will now if I write it down as x minus y, basically this unit vector, if I am writing, so I am changing this x into x minus y. So what will happen that I am calling it x minus y. So that means this p is some x from some origin and this is y. So that was the diagram if you remember last time we used. So I'm, if I'm calling this vector to be x minus y, then this is the diagram, okay? And uh, this vector will now integrate over, so I'm integrating over y, so this will keep on changing, but this will remain fixed, okay? So yeah, that is the situation. But if I do that, then, um, one second, now this is, So, all I am interested in actually checking that, ah, okay, okay, now it is clear. 
uh, that I should have mentioned. This minus sign would not be there. Why? Because there is a curve. This minus sign will come if you write this down. So this term, uh, wait. So notice this term. If I take r x minus y, this is minus delta x 1 over r. r means r is nothing but yeah, like this. Okay. So there should be a minus sign if I differentiate with respect to x. So that would have been there. So where that minus sign gone? But you notice j is in the left side. So if I put this formula, then I will have that if I put j cross like this, so I have j cross here, right? I will have this. This operator does not act on j, so I can take it out of the integration, but it is a cross product. So if I want to take the operator towards the left hand side, there will be a plus sign. Because I change the order of the cross product. If you change the order of a cross product, there is a minus sign, right? So that's why this minus sign is gone. Okay, so you understand now? Okay, fine. So immediately here, I can tell you this is called, this part is called the vector potential. This is written as A, A of X. Just like we did uh, for electrostatics, we introduced uh, scalar potential that we wrote down electric field as divergence of something and that something was scalar potential. Now we wrote down magnetic field as divergence of something and we call it vector potential. Okay, uh, I'll write that down uh, but before that, uh, just say one thing that if I write curl of B, that is mu naught by 4 pi this curl of B. So B is itself is a curl of J R. Oh, sorry, there is no unit vector. Uh, yeah, J right by R d cube x. Okay, curl of J and R. So then you can again use the vector triple product rule, and that vector triple product rule. What this will do that. Uh, Yeah, the expressions are long, actually, there is a problem. Yeah, I think this is y or x. Yeah, this is y. Okay, fine. So, this is just I expanded the triple product uh, the tri uh, using the triple product rule. Now, this is delta dot j, not entirely this is actually, oh, I am taking from outside, so these are all x, y is the integrated over variable, so these are all x. So in this case, this delta of x, uh, yeah, this delta of x will be hitting this r only, I know that, but, but, yeah, j is still vector, sorry, <laughs> there are lots of notations and so remember j is a function of y. So right now this de delta of x is hitting only this r because x is only in here. But you can always shift a total derivative because see, this is a total derivative already, right? This is like a total derivative. If you shift the total derivative, then what will happen? This you can make, you can make this acting on r. Uh, acting on j also, but you know you can change this x to y. So there are some little, 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 little points that the, this delta x acting on r, you can write it as, so what I am saying that delta x acting on r, you can write it as minus delta y acting on r, 1 by r, right, that is a formula. Then it becomes a part of the integral. Forget about this thing, this is x, this doesn't matter. This y 
it becomes a part of the integral, then you shift the total derivative, then you can make this delta y acting on this j y. But we have equation of continuity, right, already? So equation of continuity says that delta dot j is zero, because there is no charge. There is no charge. And if there is no charge, divergence of j is zero. That means this term will be zero. OK? So that is the argument that this term is finally zero. But you have to play this trick first. Then shift the total derivative. This is the argument. So if that is the case, only the second term will contribute. And the second term is a Laplacian of 1 over r. And we saw it already that this is just a Dirac delta function. It's just Dirac delta function. Basically minus 4 pi Dirac delta. So this quantity will be finally mu naught only this, curl of b is equal to mu naught c, only this part, nothing more to it. Because it will give you minus 4 pi Dirac delta, minus 4 pi, with this minus that will be plus 4 pi, this 4 pi will cancel out. J will be left with a Dirac delta, you do, do the integration, that will be J. But of X, obviously it will be of X now, not of Y. Right? So that was the argument. Yeah, J is a vector. Sorry. Uh, I have to go fast, that's why it's happening. So, <laughs> so this equation is actually famous, it is called Ampere's law. But this is wrong. Not wrong, it is not complete. The problem was this. You had to assume that there is no electric charge density. So means if there is electric charge, then this is not correct. This term is not zero. There will be a contribution from here actually. So there will be extra term coming in from here. And we will see in a different way what that term will be. That actually Maxwell introduced, fine. Okay, so automatically, as I told you, so we have two equations. One is this, Ampere's law, and one was that uh, Gauss's law. So these are the two equations that signify magnetic field. Like we had divergence of curl of electric field yesterday, the equations. They mention, they represent those things. Okay, so. I think I can rub this off here. Yeah. Okay, let me write this down then. Uh, so I define, basically I'm writing down this equation. I'm calling this quantity to be A. So this is X, this is Y, J of Y divided by r means x minus y and this so this is this much and curl of a is b so this is the definition of a magnetic field or in a reverse way if you see that some some vector if its divergence is zero that means it has to be a curl and curl of what whatever it is that is called vector potential Okay, that's how you introduce vector potential like electrostatic potential. So it's a potential for magnetic field. Okay, but it's a vector. So you should be worried about that thing, that it's a vector, it's not a thing. But secondly, one, uh, one thing you can immediately see that if I add to the vector A another vector, which is just a gradient of a scalar function, does not matter because the curl of this thing will be zero, right? Curl of A, so if I do this change, that means curl of A will go to, again curl of A, there is no change. You remember I told you that if you shift the static potential, electrostatic potential by a constant, there is no change. Same, similar situation is here. So both have this uncertainty also. So this quantity is not physical. It is never well determined. 
So that's actually leads to gauge transformation. We'll see in the last class. Okay. Uh, okay. So what you can do if I take this equation, then curl curl of A is equal to that will be simply divergence of gradient of A minus Laplacian of A is equal to mu naught G. Again for magnetostatic this quantity is 0 because there is no charge. Equation of continuity says A is divergenceless. So that means you have this equation. And you know this equation. This is Laplace equation. Although it's a vector, for each component you can separate it out. You can solve for a1, a2, a3, or ax, ay, az separately. It's the same Laplace equation as uh, you had in electrostatics. And you knew the solution. Solution was the electrostatic potential. You knew the form. So if you play the same game here, you'll arrive at this expression. Just that there was a, uh, the difference is that earlier it was plus, no, it was minus 1 over epsilon naught. Now it is minus mu naught. That's the only difference. The constant is different. Everything else is same. So you immediately know that this is a sensible result for that. But this is only true if del dot A is 0. There's an additional condition here. Okay. There is no such condition in uh, electrostatics. Okay, so I'll just write some expressions. Um, uh, now I don't want to go that much because you did all those things before, and those will lo look like uh, analog to electric field. So there is something called magnetic uh, mono uh, magnetic dipole. There is no monopole, it means there is no electric charge. If you remember the electric uh, dipole expansion. I had a monopole term which dependent on Q. There is no Q for magnetic field. So there will be now magnetic, uh, uh, I will not derive it, I'll just read the expression. Magnetic uh, moment also, magnetic dipole moment. That moment will be, yeah. This is vector potential. It's a magnetic no, don't call it magnetic. That was electrostatic. Actually, fin finally, you will see. Okay, Th that potential was electrostatic because electric field, or rather from phi, you can get only electric field. But from A, vector potential, you will get both electric field and you will get both magnetic field. The general formula I'll write it down. Although it looks like that magnetic field come um, uh, magnetic field completely comes from A, there is a dependence on, of electric field also on A that we'll find out. So because of this mapping, although phi is called electrostatic potential, A is never called a magnetic potential. It is called a vector potential. So actually in electromagnetism, electricity and magnetism not completely symmetric. They are not completely symmetric. They have a difference. Simply, you know, electric, there is an electric charge, but there is no magnetic charge. There could be a magnetic charge. Then Maxwell's equation will look exactly symmetric in electric and magnetic field. You can forget one in terms of the other. Basically, you can solve one, you'll get the result for the other one. Just some constants will be there, but that is not the case. And that's how nature works. But nothing says why there should not be a magnetic field. Magnetics monopole, sorry. Actually, honestly speaking, there can be a static potential for both electric and magnetic nature and vector potential for electric and magnetic nature. You can write down Maxwell's equation like this. You have to introduce magnetic charge and magnetic current for that. And you can write down the Maxwell's equation. You can see they look perfectly symmetric. But that is not the case. Okay, so I will just all the dipole moment for magnetism and the dipole moment is uh, defined as uh, 
some curly m half y cross g. So, okay, j is a function of y, so this will be a function of y. Let's go like this, okay. So, I'm just giving you the definition. I could have de uh, derived it, but I unfortunately I don't have time. So, I just write it down like this. And uh, you can show this that this magnetic field can be written as oh okay before that let me uh, define the total magnetic moment this is of anything any substance any circuit or anything that is given as m dqy yeah so this m magnetic moment is a constant vector because y is integrated over there is no x dependent nothing it's a constant vector so it's a, like a magnet for a magnet you have magnetic moment this is that and this is a, uh, this is because it is current multiplying or source multiplying with position it's like a dipole moment so that is the lowest entity you can have and that's why you can write down the magnetic field you just take on the expressions i am uh, not deriving them anymore uh, that is 3 y unit vector y unit vector dot m minus m divided by y vector cube so the magnetic field this magnetic field that i define this magnetic field can be in general expressed like this if that is the only source like that but that is not the case with elect electrostatics. Electrostatics, electric field is fundamentally 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square. So this is somehow electric charge, but there is Y dependence because this is R, R square, this is Y cube, you can see already. So that shows that there is no magnetic charge, again, indirectly, in a very complicated way, <laughs> okay? Uh, Fine. So finally, what happens? Uh, I'll see this magnetic moment. If you say, if you have a medium, and there are lots of uh, because of the magnetic field, there are lots of induced magnetic moments in the medium. This is the way we thought that there will be electric um, electric dipoles. There are lots of magnetic dipoles. Say, in a medium, you put magnetic field B. There are lots of magnetic field traversing. So there will be small, small dipoles, magnetic dipoles, like this, forming inside. All of them, if you just gather them out, then that will give you a magnetic feedback of the system. And so you actually can write down the magnetic field, or you can write down the electric potential, uh, sorry, um, I should say vector potential, like this. Okay, I will put the derivations in the note, so <laughs> you will be able to, you know, see the derivations. So what I'm saying that if I put a uh, consider a medium, so there will be many many magnetic moments coming up, and they will be now position dependent. So I'm putting a position dependence here. So I'm just generalizing this expression here. So if I put this, I can write down the vector potential like this. This J is the original current that is creating the magnetic field, and this is the feedback from the material because of small, small dipoles forming. So these two terms, this will be extra contribution in presence of a um, uh, medium, and uh, 
uh, what you can see that this is uh, one second now uh, which is the sitting and double card okay so now if i take two cards from this side curl curl of a i i take curl two times so this curl of one curl of a will be b right yeah No, Any my car is in the front. Okay, anyone's car from up here should move by now, otherwise it will be stuck. Uh, including the set here, the car. Uh, because there is rain. It's raining. Okay. And it is stuck in the mud. Okay. Okay. So this curl away, I just took two curls. So the first curl, I can make it B. And if you move this curl inside, uh, you can see the, uh, there will be a double curl acting on here, and there will be a triple curl acting on here. You get it? There will be a triple curl acting on here, this quantity. So that you have to evaluate. That's a kind of a long, uh, thing, uh, but it's like vector calculus, so simple but long. But if you finally evaluate, what will happen? This will finally give you mu naught j plus curl of capital M. And this capital M, this quantity is the integration. This capital M is uh, integration of m y over d cube y. This is the total magnetic moment of the whole medium. So this is the expression we get. And now I can see there is a curl of B here, there is a curl of M sitting in here. Right. So I can move it in this side. And also say I divide it by mu naught. If I do that, I find something looks this like this. where this H is actually traditionally called the magnetic field. So traditionally H is the magnetic field, not B, but we use them interchangeably, mainly because usually we neglect the medium. So if there is no medium, this magnetization is zero. So apart from a constant, H and B are the same. So Maxwell's equation, or I should say Ampere's law in the most general form is this, but still it is not complete. That we'll see later on. And finally, okay, I just collect the results uh, that for magnetic field, uh, we can show that the energy, magnetic energy, is nothing but 1 by 2 mu naught integration d cube x square. This is the expression for magnetic energy. You remember we found out the energy for electrostatic field also. How? Through work done. To find this, you have to again find the work done. And that work done will be OK. To find the work done, actually, to arrive at uh, this equation, we need to know something which was mainly due to Faraday. We need to know the Faraday's law. because. I told you again, magnetic field, if you want to know the force and everything, you have to apply a current and you have to consider the motion. So means time dependent will come into the picture. And finally, we are going to handle this. So at this moment, we are going out of magnetostatics officially. 
and then you have induction. Induction means that because of magnetic field you can have electric field, because of electric field you can have magnetic field. That was what Faraday experimentally found. So what he saw, Michael Faraday saw, that you have a circuit, just you have a circuit, some circuit and there is no voltage. It was an inert circuit. It was of just close. But if you have a nearby circuit, say point 0.1, if you have a nearby circuit where there is current, if current here changes in the nearby circuit, there will be a current here. You can detect current here. But if there is a constant current, there is nothing here. Okay. Second, if so uh, current I changes here. Only then you can find current here. Now second situation, there is a constant current here in the second circuit, but this circuit is moving with respect to this. Then you can find a current here. And third, you take a magnet, north pole, south pole. You move this magnet. If you move this near this, near this circuit, you will find current. So Faraday with great insight he figured out that all these three things will create man, magnetic, magnetic flux through this second circuit but or magnetic lines of force or there will be a magnetic field associ um, associated with this circuit because of these arrangements, each of these arrangements and if you move them obviously the magnetic field is changing or magnetic flux is changing. Or if you changing the current also, that also means the magnetic flux is changing. And because it is changing, current is getting induced here. So he wrote down something very simple. And that was that oh, first you need to know what is F, magnetic flux. I am using curly F. The total flux is nothing but B dot ds through a surface. So like total intensity, uh, total field across the surface, that is flux. So you integrate the uh, lines of forces, that is flux. And in this circuit, you have a current. So if there is current, you talk about, uh, yeah, you talk about the work done here, the energy. And that energy usually the uh, it is called EMF electromotive force that the force which is actually moving it's actually not a force the term electromotive force is misleading it is actually energy so it just says it is actually equivalent to potential it is potential difference so what is the energy associated with this current motion that we calculated yesterday that is just curly E E dot DL and what Faraday saw that change in this F magnetic flux results in this E because you see current in the circuit. Okay. So the equation was very simple, he wrote it down. This is rate of change in flux is equal to the EMF induced totally from experiments and Faraday was not very good in mathematics not because he was not smart because he never could finish high school. So he was a very poor, from a very poor background, not even a complete high school degree and he became the director of Cavendish laboratory in this time. You know what Cavendish laboratory is. There's the biggest theoretical physics laboratory right now and also experimental physics in Cambridge. So he became that. Yeah, he took charge and one of his students was Maxwell. And that guy was a high school dropout. He became an assistant or something like that. So that shows actually, that's very inspiring, honestly. Okay, fine. So this is the equation he conjured. And out of that, we can play around and we can build things. But there's a minus sign if you notice. Why that minus sign? The minus sign physically says that if you keep on changing magnetic field, that doesn't mean 
that you can create infinite current. There will be something that will oppose that current, that change. The change of magnetic field happening in this circuit that will be opposed by something. And that something is actually a secondary magnetic field that gets produced. See what happens, magnetic field changing, so this current will produce. Because of this current, there is another magnetic field will be produced. And that magnetic field will exactly oppose the original magnetic field, the change of the original magnetic field. That is called Lenz law. And because of that, energy is finite. Otherwise, you can have perpetual motion. So that's why this minus sign. Oh, sorry, this minus sign. Does it go on? Yeah? Does it go on? No, it cannot go on. Yeah, that, that cycle can go on. That cycle can go on. But if you can differentiate out um, experimentally, you can see it. Yeah. But, but one thing. Cons if the first magnetic field changes, there will be a current and there will be a second magnetic field. That second magnetic field needs to change to produce current in third. So you have to care, take care of that also. So only then. Uh, okay. So now, from this formula, if I write it down from here, that this is E dot dl is equal to minus yeah, dv dt, so there will be surface integral. Inside, I should write differentiation of B. But see, B itself now changes through time. So if I write this B, this B is, although there is a integration over S, whatever variable I take, uh, let me call, take this variable, oh, whatever, say X or say Y, but it's a function of T also. And classical mechanic, y is also a function of t. Position is a function of time, right? So you, when you take the derivative, you just don't take a derivative of b with time. You take a chain rule also. And that chain rule says that this is a this is dy dt dot divergence of B, uh, so gradient of B, yeah, gradient, mm. dot ds. Be careful, there are two dot products. This dot product associates B with ds. That, that is the original dot product here, whatever here. The second dot product relates this dy dt with this gradient. This is the chain rule. What is db dt, del b del t, if you say the uh, partial derivative separately? Then it will be del b del x. So this term looks like something like this. In scalar notation, it looks like something like this. Because this is the pure b time dependence, which is taken care of. But then x, or the y also depends on time, so you have to apply the chain rule and in vector sign it is taken. And that is why, uh, because there is a confusion, there are two dot products. If I write it down like this, you don't know actually with which, uh, with which one I'm taking the dot product. Really it's better to use uh, this indices, ij indices at least. But then it will, it will become longer and confusing. For this actually, remember this is true. Yeah? B, no, B is a vector. No, 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 uh, gradient, this is gradient of a vector. You can take a gradient of a vector, not a big deal. If that gradient operator itself is a scalar. Why it is a scalar? Because it, there is a dot product with y. So this is not a gradient operator. This is this quantity into gradient operator. Because you will have del x, so you usually have this, right? Or dx dt plus del b del y dy dt, right, it will end plus z component like this. So I can combine this uh, dy dt into delta y, d, dx dt into delta x into this. So that is that operator. Okay. And 
this quantity is just v velocity. This is the velocity, right? So this will be minus s then t b. Sorry, b is vector b plus v dot delta b ds. This is this much. Mm. But I can write it down as plus curl of b cross b dot ds. Why I can write it down like this? The reason being, okay, you see in reverse, this is a vector triple product, right? You break it down. You'll find two terms. One will be this, the other term will contain divergence of b, and divergence of b is zero. So that's why I can do this transformation. Okay. So this is the equation, but right now, We'll feel uh, we'll play a small game, and remember uh, this v is actually the velocity of the circuit responsible for magnetic field b. Because this v is coming out of b, right? Coordinate of b, and b depends on the this second circuits, not this circuit. Uh, we come from yeah, this side. So that means this is the velocity of the circuit. So if I say that circuit is not moving. That circuit is not moving. If I am saying that, uh, what will happen? That this term will be zero, or rather, mathematically, what v is equal to zero. That means this term is zero. So what will have that e dot dl will be only this part. And here, if I apply uh, Stokes theorem, because this will be curl over ds, right? Because this is actually a line integral. See, because it's a closed circuit. So that will be simply will give me curl of e is equal to minus del b del t, and this is Faraday's law of magnetic induction. Oh, so v is equal to zero. It's a it's a particular situation that I can always find the velocity of the second circuit will be zero. Why? I'll tell you why. It's actually relativity. You go to the co-moving frame. The second circuit, the source of magnetic field, you say it is not moving. You go to that frame. If it was moving, then you say you go to the co-moving frame. Or you say it was already stationary, that both circuits were stationary, that means this was not the case. Current was not induced because of the circuit moving, but current was in, uh, induced because the current in here was changing. You can say that. Or you can say you go to the uh, race frame or co-moving frame of this circuit, and if you do that, this becomes moving for you. But that velocity we don't, know, don't bother about. Third case again, it's a magnet. You, you sit on the magnet. Magnet has a magnet. If you sit on the magnet, there is no velocity, right? Okay. So that is the situation. But that is completely covariant, so it's a very general case. And this is the first equation where electric and magnetic field came together. And this is a magnet, a complete mag, uh, Maxwell's equation. This is uh, Faraday's law. It does not get changed. Obviously, it cannot change if you bring in electric field because already there is electric field. Right. So fine. So we talked about this uh, this rule by Faraday. This is actually Faraday's law. This is also Faraday's law. This is the most familiar form. So if you consider that, then finally, what you will have that I'll just. Uh, write the, uh, just uh, write down the result. You see this change in energy, dw dt, 
is equal to what is the change in energy in this circuit if there is some current this is moving because of some emf the current is moving and because the current is moving there is a current it's a time variation right the energy of the system will change so usually the change in um, change in energy of the system is nothing but that work done emf multiplied with current because what was the energy energy was q into e energy itself by definition was q into e sorry force force itself is q into e right so let me write force is q into e right so energy w is q into e into dl integration let me put the integration here but i am calling this quantity to be curly e right there see it is curly e right this one right so this is q into e or so called emf hmm? so if i say dw dt this is dq dt into e because emf is the energy uh, conserved energy it does not change that much so dq dt is i so that's why i e is the energy but you are talking about work done against the field itself so that's why there is a minus sign like before we talked and this is from that relation is i df dt so rate of change of magnetic flux that will come in yeah i just applied the first form of faraday's law so this is the relation and from there you can uh, actually i will not do the derivation anymore so you can write down uh, the energy to be this much this is the energy expression for the magnetic field we'll just use this result in the later part uh, i think i have only more than half an hour so i don't know so let me for this half hour let me introduce maxwell's equations finally so i'll be very selective uh, i will share my notes with you uh, it will take under 24 hours maybe i'll i'm just typing it out so you can see the consistency anyhow so okay uh, we don't need this results anymore i'll write down the equations again So we have many equations now, actually four of them. Or rather, let me write this capital D, if there is a medium. And if there is no medium, it goes to then divergence of B is always 0. Then I have Faraday's law. If there is a medium, this is this, or okay. So this is Coulomb. This says no monopole. This is Faraday. And this is Ampere. Okay, so these are the four equations. I'm coming to that. That is what actually Maxwell originally did. So, what happened till now? 
all of them were okay this is about induction this is from electrostatics this is from magnetostatics but while deriving this this equation we had to assume that rho or charge density is zero charge density is zero we just had to assume that and we arrived at this equation problem was that usually you have charge density then what will happen and there is one more reason actually this equation is not covariant but that form is not clear till now um, I will introduce the notations so what Maxwell says that this equation corresponds to 0 means there is no charge continuity equation is all, only this much but what if there is charge so if there is charge you have rather j plus del rho del t is equal to 0 right this much so you can write this equation again as right i can write it down like this on uh, into epsilon naught right yeah into epsilon naught from here i can write it down or if i substitute from here i can uh, yeah let me keep d it will be easier because that will be the general form then we can go to the no medium thing yeah i can write it down right, like this just here rho i substitute with the averages of d if i write it down then i can define a more generalized current density which is this and equal to zero and this is what divergence is maxwell did a very simple thing he just took this expression substituted here So, you got this Ampere Maxwell law that curl of H is J plus del D del T. And if there is no medium in that case, you will go to curl of B is equal to mu naught J plus let me write it down it like this where there is a quantity called c and that's a very 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 important thing that is what makes the inverse run honestly what is this as of now this is a constant where c is equal to 1 over root over mu naught epsilon naught how it came you know because if i change d to e when there is no dipole moment or anything magnetic electric moment running out so it will be epsilon naught into e so that epsilon naught will come out then h to b if i move there is no magnetic dipole then there is a 1 by mu naught standing here you see that mu naught will multiply that's why this mu naught here mu naught is here so mu naught epsilon naught and that is written as 1 over c square okay so this is the notation Okay, so we have these four equations now, and let me write them in uh, this uh, this part, not this D and H. Let me write it in this uh, when there is no medium. So I'm saying free space. Oh, I also mentioned one thing: if there is medium, this constants, although they will be absorbed there will be not mu naught or epsilon naught this not not prefix uh, will go medium those are those value changes so these are only true for vacuum okay but whatever i am going to do now is applicable only for vacuum and that is very important so free space you have the equations to be rho by epsilon naught then
Okay, no, let me write it in the other way. So these are the four Maxwell's equation in free space. You can write it in uh, in the presence of medium also, doesn't matter. Okay. So these are the four, four Maxwell's equation and all the electrodynamics, everything you know, uh, apart from uh, you are being pulled down to the earth, everything you experience in your whole life and you will experience in your whole life unless you are a high energy experimental physicist, that is because of these equations, these four equations. There is nothing more to nature. Why you can see me, why you can hear me, why your body does not, you know, just break down if somebody sits on you or you can punch somebody, you can shout, everything is this. There is no more physics, honestly, in practical life. If you go to high energy, low scale, that's a different thing. Then strong, weak interaction will come down. You go to cosmology, you will get gravity. But in this room, there is only electrodynamics and there is nothing more. <laughs> okay. So it is this simple, nature is this simple, honestly. So what do you see in this equation? So there are two vector equations and two scalar equations. So if you see this line, this is for scalar, right? Only dot products. And these two equations for vectors. But if you see in this direction, you see two things. In these two equations, you have source. So that means it gives the dynamics of the field. Okay, there is source. So it gives dynamics. And in these two equations, if you see, there is no source, but it links variables. It just depicts relation between variables, variable components. It links the, you know, the components of magnetic field. It links the components of electric and magnetic field. So these are actually constraints. And if you have heard in classical mechanics, what they say that obviously you can write one component in terms of other. So not all components are free. That means when you are try to solve these two equations, if you count the number of variables, that will be decreased, right? But you can ask me one thing, they are also, uh, components are linked, not true. Because of the sources, that is important thing. Sources can be anything. So if you define relations from these equations between components of the electric and magnetic field, that relation will keep on changing depending on the source. So that is not essential in relation, right? That depends on the source. So these are not constraints. This cannot be constraints because they have source terms. It's a very special case when sources are zero, you can uh, think they are, con they are also like constraint equation, like they are just relation between components. But that's a very special case. The general situation is not that, okay? So these are the two classes of Maxwell's equations. You have to notice this and that will come into play. So, uh, what you, I can talk about and all here. Okay, let me find the wave equation. What do I mean by wave equation? I want to substitute B in terms of E and E in terms of B. Because in uh, most of the equation, E and B are mixed up. I want to separate them out. I want to eliminate E in terms of B. And why I can do it? Because of these two equations. I can do it, right? Because they are constraints, they are relating the components. So how to do it? Process is, you take double curls. So there are how many curl equations? Two curl equations, right? So I take, let me first take curl of B curl curl of B, if I can take, then it is mu naught curl of J plus 1 by C square 
LLT Carnovi. Okay. But this Carnovi, this Carnovi, I already have in that second equation, right? From Faraday's law, that I can substitute, and this one I can expand as. vector triple product rule this much and already we know that this is zero from the magnetic monopole equation so this is zero and here i have mu naught curl of j and this one is minus 1 by c square curl of del b del t oh no sorry there won't be curl it is minus del square del t square a I substituted from Faraday's law. The minus sign will come. So immediately you can see this is 1 by c square del square del p square minus Laplacian square. This operator acting on b to mu naught j. One equation. You play the same game. Take the curl of this. Then curl curl a or uh, then there will be curl curl e. Then there will be divergence of V, substitute from here. Then there will be curl of uh, Laplacian of V, you keep it. In this side, curl of B, you substitute this whole thing and you keep it. And what you will get? You will get 1 by C square del square del T square minus P is equal to minus rho. Yeah. There is a minus here. Yep. Okay. So I am using a shorthand notation. Just remember right now. Immediately you can see that apart from this side, and this side is basically sources, current density and charge density. Left hand side is exactly same. Only the electric field is replaced by the magnetic field. So they are in the same footing. That's why they are called equivalent. They are linked, they are linked, true, that is true. But also they are at the same level, same footing. That is more important. And that's why Maxwell's equation say that the, that is called electromagnetic, because electric and magnetic field are equivalent also. Not only they are linked. So I'm just using a notation, this curly delta square for this whole bracket. Just a shorthand notation, just remember that. But actual thing is this, okay? So immediately, yeah. Immediately you can see that if there is no source, means j is equal to zero, rho is equal to zero, if that is the case, then I have simply zero right? from this. If I break it down, then this is one by c square e or b. I can call it to be some field f is equal to. So f stands for both e and b. If that is the case. They are exactly the same equation they satisfy. Right. And this is the classical wave equation. This is the classical wave equation. What you uh, did in um, like uh, your uh, wave, wave motion classes, that whatever flows like this, sine, cos, or exponential, that is this. From this, I can immediately see, first of all, that E and B will satisfy a solution, will have a solution. Where omega, where K modulus is omega divided by C. That's the only possibility. The classical wave uh, solution, that's why these are called wave. That is the electromagnetic wave, nothing more than that. But also, remember one thing, such a pure plane, 
pure so-called plane wave, we know it's a plane wave, is possible only when source is not there. When there is a source, when there is some medium or something coming in, there are no more plane waves. There will be some complicated wave structures. So this wave you have only in complete vacuum when there is no charge and all. Okay? And what is this? This light. This is the equation for this light, you see. And this gives you something more important. In classical wave equation, this quantity is the speed of the wave. So this is the speed of the wave. So that is the physical meaning of this C. That's why I wrote it down like this. In what? When there is no charge and, but this is true when there is no charge and in vacuum, in, in absence of medium. I told you this is in absence of medium, in free space. It is possible then. So this is the speed of light in vacuum. But if you look at the theory, so this is a physical law, experimentally established, theoretically established, this is a physical law. And it should be same for everyone, right? If he sees a different law, this equation changes from him, then what is the use for these equations? There is no use. But if these equations are same for uh, all observers, all over the universe, that means this C is also fixed for vacuum. But what is C physically? It's the speed of that wave. So for the first time in physics, people found out that there is a speed which is constant, no matter how you're observing it. If you're even moving with this wave, you will see C is equal to C. C will not change. If that changes, these equations are not true. If these equations are true, C is fixed for any observer. And that was the realization which made Einstein to derive special relativity. Maxwell's equations made Einstein derive special relativity. That is the truth. You know, Maxwell gave his equation in 1860s, 70s maybe, 1865 if I am not wrong. From then, on to last 35, 40 years, till 1905, people are trying to prove that this is not true. You can see this value of C change, depending on the observation. Every experiment, Michelson-Morley experiment, fabry perot interferometer, every experiment, optics grew just to prove that this is wrong. They gave the concept of ether because of this C, that there is a medium in vacuum with respect to which you can move, and every experiment came negative. But nobody was brave enough to admit that this is true. But there is another reason also they were afraid. Because if you apply Galilean, Galilean kinematics, Galilean laws to these equations, or I should say you apply Newton's laws to make sense out of it, there can be only two outcomes. Either Newton laws are wrong or this is wrong. So the only thing to do was that to say Newton was wrong and nobody was brave enough to do that. Einstein was not brave enough, Einstein was stupid because he was not an established scientist, he was a patent clerk. That's why he, you know, he was just, you know, skipping his work and calculating. He just published something and didn't care. And everybody was mad at him for 10 years, more than 10 years, mostly British people because Newton was British. <laughs> so, that was, so that's how C comes in. Yeah, I wanted to tell you this story. This story is very important because otherwise there is no fun in physics. <laughs> okay, so I can find this wave equation and everything from uh, electric field and magnetic field. So where does the potential lie? Uh, let me keep them. I introduced so much potential and everything to you. Okay. So, if you go to the potential formulation, there's one thing that you know this equation that curl of B, or the diversion of B is zero. So, B is curl of A, I know. B is curl of A. Okay? And I also know that electric field is minus divergence of phi. Right? 
and I know I can shift phi by a constant term, does not make any difference and I can change A vector by divergence term. So, A going to, so I am saying the A going to A plus delta lambda and phi going to phi plus some constant say lambda, something like this, some constant say. You just do not forget, yeah. But there is a small problem. The problem is that yeah, Faraday's law. And Faraday's law was actually critical in getting into Maxwell's equation. I told you that Maxwell thought electricity and magnetism were the same because of this Faraday's law. So till now we know this part only. So, if I now put this expression into Faraday's law, I will have curl of E is equal to minus del del T curl of A, right. I will have this. So, I can take it in this side. So, I have curl of E plus del A del T is equal to 0. I can have this. So, what does it mean? That this quantity inside the bracket either can be 0, that is a very particular case, but what is the most general situation? That this thing is a gradient again. This is a gradient of something. If it is a gradient, then the curl is 0. So, the general solution is that E plus del A del T is a gradient, but I know electric field itself is a gradient from electrostatics. So, let me choose put that quantity itself. So, that means that electric field in terms of potentials is minus del A del T minus delta phi. So, what I told before that why it is not called magnetic potential because of this, because electric field also depends on it. Now, you see, okay. Secondly, now, what about this statement? This is true, B is curl of A, so curl, this is true. But here, E, this, this was from electrostatics, that is why there was something missing here that came here that is del A del T. Now, what will happen if I, so this is the complete expression for me now from Maxwell's equations or from Faraday's law. Now, I want that to find how can I change this A and phi so that both B and A, E remains the same. For B, I know that if I do just this, I just change it with a divergence. So, let me do it for E. So, I do A to A plus delta. So, that means this will mean B will go to B, no change. What about E? E will go to minus del A del T minus this much A changes to A plus delta lambda, right. And this one. So, this is different, this is not E. So, there is only one possibility and that possibility is that I know I can change phi also. Even from before I can say I can change phi also. And how can you change phi? I need to change phi to cancel this term. So, if my phi changes to phi minus, this will cancel out and that is electric field again. So, my job is done that electric and magnetic field remain the same. 
सो द चेंजेस आर ए गोइंग टू ए प्लस डेल्टा ए डेल्टा लैमडा एंड फाइव गोइंग टू फाइव माइनस टाइम डिराविटिव ऑफ द सेम लैमडा सो दिस स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट दिस स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट बिकॉज इट इज ओनली लिमिटेड टू इलेक्ट्रोस्टेटिक्स बट in general this is the case these are the gauge transformation the famous gauge transformations and under which electric and magnetic field remains the same so maxwell's equation remain the same energy of electric and magnetic field remain the same everything remains the same so why we are getting this that there is a set of transformation and this lambda can be anything there is a set of transformation under which the system is unchanged that is because these set of equations there is a constraint in the system so e and b three components each there are six components that is not the entire theory like actually that is more than the entire theory that is like over counting degrees of freedom there are not six degrees of freedom there are less actually you can count how many equations are there no four this is a scalar equation this is a vector equation so essentially there are four relations three of them right x y z components and there is one of the four equations how many variables are there electric field three components magnetic field three components six so 6 minus 4 is equal to 2 that is the actual degrees of freedom you see classical mechanics classical mechanics says that subtract find out the components first of the variable then subtract the number of constant equations you will get the degree of freedom done you will find that is true and because of this constraint effect you can play this game and exactly you can change four values 3 of a 1 of 5 you can change four values okay so that is the gauge freedom uh, what people talk about and you can go one step more you can substitute uh this expression and this expression into maxwell's equation play the same game of taking extra curl and you can find wave equations in terms of a and phi i'll just write down the wave equations uh they look like this much for this i did the same trick i took uh, curl of this equation and curl of this equation but yeah i know it's like under 5 minutes curl of this equation and curl of this equation like i did there and find out the wave function just i substituted also electric field with potential magnetic field with potential i arrived at this and i am calling it wave function but is it a wave function no it is not a wave function You remember this operator? This uh, so uh, oh sorry 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 no this is delta square yeah this is the same delta square that uh, one over c square you remember I gave the notation this is okay one over c square delta square minus nebula square this is delta square there so for being a wave equation I want to remove these parts completely. I know I can move the sources. I can remove the sources. I know that because sources I can consider complete vacuum. There are no current, no charge. I can do that. But what about these terms? It is not a wave equation. But I know one thing: this a and phi I can change if I want to. I can choose them, and that is called gauge fixing. Ah. Uh, so what gauge fixing you choose particular values of this lambda there is see only one parameter although there are four fields there is only one parameter lambda you can fix it you can choose one relation that means 
that the relation I choose, I can choose to be this one. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a mistake. This is delta. This is nebula. This is not delta square. This is this part is not here here. So I can choose. So one choice is so-called covariant gaze. I choose this whole bracket to be zero. If this whole bracket is zero, that means delta square A is right hand side something, right? So that is uh, del dot A plus one by C square del phi is equal to zero. If I choose this, that is one condition, right? I had one parameter to fix, I chose one condition, I can do that. So that means the second equation will give me del square A is equal to mu naught J. And you will see if you just substitute it here, this del divergence of A is here, if you substitute from here, you will again get this one. That is DL inversion basically. So again, you got the same wave equation. If you just now remove the sources, you get the plane wave solutions. Same, again, speed is C square, everything passes through. And here, you see immediately that you can consider A and phi at the same footing. As if this A is the space component and phi is the time component. As if this j is the space component, rho is the time component of some four vector. This is covariance. And I'll just uh, leave you with one final expression that I can write down this equation very efficiently like this. This is all of electrodynamics. Okay, gaze fixed, but this is all of electrodynamics. This is the classical wave equation. So this mu mu, you know, it is relativistic. I won't introduce anything, uh, this notations and all. So there are lots of things which were left uh, I wanted to tell you about. Uh, there will be in the notes. Uh, hopefully we'll get some chance to talk again. So you can uh, like uh, fill it up and if you have any questions just come up to me later also we can discuss and uh, like uh, here this uh, after this gaze transformation actually i could have shown you that uh, you know light wave travels in a matter even the signals you cannot get instantaneously it will take some finite time all those uh, things will can be derived from it. and there are many many other things so thank you very much and uh, thank you for attending this school all together. So, all of you. Thanks.